You haven't heard cool. of gymnastics? No, for, for Watch, <laughs> ninja. I've heard ninja. Yeah. Oh. So they they have <laughs> never. <laughs> I'm like, my God, deep. Brady, how deep are you? Minnesota, Montana. You did look not like do you you're well. deep, but how deep biggest, are you really? The biggest rock I live under. Um, but they changed it to ninja class, so it's like that ninja warrior stuff. Uh -huh. It's awesome. My kid loves it. So that's what. Do my they have like the whole are. course? He can whole, swing from all the thing. Th yeah. Do right they have now, a warped wall? He's learning like more of the basics right now, like. Uh, like rolling and balance beams and uh -huh. then they'll like swing from something to make it fun. At the there end you go. Night. He loves it. But that's what my Saturdays are. We're typically, well, in the past they were duck hunting and weekend warrior stuff. And now it's yeah, I haven't, class. I haven't seen my wife on a Saturday in like eight years. <laughs> yeah. We just, well, you have three kids. we divide. Yeah. One goes with one kid, the other goes with the other. And then the other one's finally old enough that he can kind of do what on he wants. Yeah. And sometimes we see him, sometimes we don't, but I just, Saturdays, are, I haven't had a Saturday other than hunting season. Yeah, like crazy, they're just, man. they're your kids' days. I feel like such an oddball over here. <laughs> <laughs> like listening to both of you. Well, where this started from is Ethan just walked in. His wife's going right yeah. now. Ethan's wife is he in labor in and as said, we hey, speak. Hey, I'll see you guys later. My wife's going right now. Oh, right I'm like, now. oh shit. He looked like luck. his wife was just went into labor. <laughs> yeah, he did look like <laughs> yeah, so he out. looked pretty shook up. Yeah. So I was like, Ethan. hey, Ethan, it's going to be okay. And he's Healthy like, oh, I'm baby. fine. I'm like, the fuck you are. <laughs> you, don't, you don't look. <laughs> you do not look fine. <laughs> you're, you're exuding something else. I can oh, tell. Yeah. My, my brother had his kid on opening day of my muzzleloader hunt. So we were yeah. sat messaging. Oh, really? Yeah. So yeah, he, he actually said I was the first to know. I didn't even know before any other family. He's oh, like, that's you, awesome. you just messaged me at the right time because I wanted you wanted to know about bulls. Yeah, he's of like, course. And, and then he's like, and by the way, I just yeah. had a kid. Yeah. <laughs> but he said it's the most stressful thing ever. Like Ethan does not know what he's going to do. But Miller said he was up for like forty eight hours straight. <laughs> Boy or girl? A girl. Everything they, they good? didn't even know the, the sex beforehand. Oh wow! Yeah, they I wanted can, to be surprised. Camille. No Camille. kidding. Little little Camille. When are you going to meet your Miller. niece? Uh, probably Thanksgiving when I go. On my uh, deer hunt, my family. Does Brady hold babies? Can you picture Brady holding no, a baby? I don't know no. if I've held a baby. I can't picture that. <laughs> really? I don't want to drop them. I can't, I can't picture that. No way. <laughs> I'll hold dogs and puppies. That's will you, a take, a, will you take a picture of you holding a baby? I'll try. Just That'd break the internet right there. <laughs> yeah, so that was, that was really cool. I'm like opening day wow. of hunt. That's really cool. So I found on a sat messenger and I like, I'm like, felt bad because I missed out on all the family texts. Like the whole family has a big group text going on. And here I am. But no he service. wanted to know about bulls. He wanted to know about bulls. You, this is how you know hunters. When this did one. you actually see a picture of your niece? When I, the first day I got back on Saturday night. So saw, after, saw after I killed and packed out and finally got service and then I saw a photo. <laughs> Cause like I don't have any service back there unless you have a different carrier, but yeah, Verizon true. doesn't. This is how you know a true hunter. Like your brother having a baby, but he wanted to know about bulls first. So that's what he did. He was literally messaging me the whole time. Like, hey, yeah. how's he, what, what, did you, what happened with eight by nine? You seen bulls today? How big is the other one? Is that one 360? Is that one 340? Like, yeah. he kept going on and on and, and wanted by the all way, the details. And by the way, I just had a kid. Had a baby. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then my wife, she went to the doctor yesterday and they're like, oh, you could go any day. And I told my wife, I'm like, actually, this is, it's a good day because I could hunt like October and then late October, right before Halloween for whitetails and then, you know, baby's birthday. And then I could leave and go hunt whitetails in November, you know, there in November. Yeah. It's perfect. That was my first response. Well, congrats to your brother. Yeah. yeah. He's pretty pumped. What's his name? Camille. Oh, my brother? Yeah, brother. Bryce. Bryce. Yeah. Shout out Bryce. Yeah. Congratulations Bryce. to Bryce Miller. He had to balance. He was really bummed because, I mean, because he had I a should, baby and no, he wasn't hunting out. Because like, uh, obviously, you know. Having a kid during hunting season can be a little stressful, and he really wants to go out west. Yeah. Having a baby in any time is stressful. Yeah. yeah, so we had to really watch what, we, what he applied for, and luckily it came early enough where now we have like a three-week gap roughly until we go chase some mule deer bucks. So he's hoping everything's good and he can get sneak away. I was like, Bryce, you better be on your best behavior He'll for the be next good. three weeks. He's like, yeah, I'm just hanging out with the kid as much as I can. I'm like, are you, are you taking maternity leave too? And he's like, no, I own my own business. I can't. He's yeah, like, no so he's just running around with his head cut off like – be like, ah, it's not that bad, but I'm like, you better be able to go hunting with us. Cause what's what? Uh, so that's the first kid, first kid in my family, yeah. First one, yeah. You're, you're, you made, he made grandparents. How do your your folks? Oh yeah, they're they gonna be happy. I'll bet they'll yeah. probably just spend all their time. Oh, they're they're gonna spoil. They it. live close to your dad. Yeah, close. To like your they, mom they, and dad? they actually live in my old house I grew up in. Oh, that's so awesome. they're raising a kid. Yeah, in that's awesome. the house that my family raised kids in. That's cool. Oh, very cool. Today's Halloween. You're dressed up. I am. Me, um, me, and, me and Lorenzo missed the memo, I guess. Well, we have kids. 
whole all <laughs> yesterday and today is all my kid. He's got five different costumes, wardrobe changes, the whole deal. So I didn't have time to do myself. Yeah, I stayed at Brady's house last night, and uh, he told me he was going to dress up. I tore like apart my lawn, my uh, the closet right across my laundry room this morning after you left, yeah. trying to find all my gear, and I couldn't find my Grundin uh, coveralls, my yeah. rainproof <laughs> ones. But throwing it back to when I was, uh, you know. Killing lake trout, gill netting in Montana. <laughs> You're looking good, man. So Grundens were our, our like, li- literally lived in Grundens every single day. And this is a jacket that I absolutely love that you can't get anymore. So I feel like OG because it's all waterproof up to the Damn. arms. So you can dip your hand in the water, pulling it's up like nets. real waterproof. Yeah. And then it's fleecy up top. Yeah. You're going to get hot in that bad boy. And I got the old extra tufts on. This is like my second pair because we destroy them. The up good there, old extra tufts. Fish- I was wearing extra tufts. You got extra tufts cool. Yeah, and I've got the Helly Hansen pants on because I couldn't go. find the other ones. Extra tufts are a funny thing. Like, they took over fashion. Yeah, twice. now it's a fashion thing. It's like so fashionable oh, to Seattle. have the extra tufts folded over. Like, bro, have you ever <laughs> needed those? Yeah. I was with my kid this weekend, and this lady walked up. She starts talking to me. Oh, you have a kid here? Yeah, we're shooting the bull. And uh, I'm looking at her just head to toe. And I was like, oh, so where are you from originally? Yeah. She's from Washington or Oregon. <laughs> you <laughs> already knew. Yeah, it was a rhetorical sure. question. For yeah. sure. Yeah, I'm from Washington. Yeah, same thing. Boots, you know, the extra tough. Fold it over. Yeah, nose yeah. ring. So I was the like, oh, I, you're I definitely from Washington. I should really try to find a picture for this podcast. Maybe we can throw on the video because, like, there's a picture of us in his backcountry log cabin. So we had a boat flown in with the helicopter. Like, it was that's cool. There's no road to this lake, and we were killing lake trout up there, gilding it, and I'm getting rid of it because of the endangered bull trout. They're encroaching on them. And uh, we have this picture where we hung like 30 fish on this Forest Service cabin, like dead lake trout. And then we're all standing there with our extra tufts and our grundins on. And it's like a, cool. it's like a black and white photo before like this is like a point and shoot where you had to like select the black and white mode <laughs> cool. to do it. And it's like a, just a us just like you know hands crossed like looking like a badass Any big fish. No, there weren't a giant fish in there. Like maybe like fifteen twenty pounds. That's the biggest good one. Fish. You've been to Brady's house before. No, I haven't actually. He's got uh, so he's got his geese hanging up, mounted on the one wall, and then he's got his paddle fish that he just mounted. That's cool. I just walked around Brady's house last night, just like looking at random ass animals. Like, tell me about this paddle fish, and we talked about we it. We talked They're about paddle fish for looking animal, man. Yeah, they are crazy. I've never seen one in real life. They are ever. weird They're looking so cool. animal. Tiny t- little eyes, far forward. Yeah, let's talk about how bill. you basically cut around the tail, and you can like pull out the whole, you know, spinal column, and then it stakes. Really? From from the gill plate all the way back, it's steaks? steaks, and it tastes he like halibut. Really well, really, yeah, Holy phenomenal. Shit. You ever I've heard killed, that? No, I've I've two of them. Phenomenal steaks. Really? Zero interest in paddlefish at all up until last night when I looked at it on the wall and I was like, "Oh, that looks pretty dang cool. Yeah. <laughs> I want to see one of those in the wild." Yeah, uh, yeah. let's go. They were, yeah, yeah sturgeon, same cream. thing. I was yeah. just like, "Huh." My, Do you my, have sturgeon uh, too? Do you have a sturgeon? No, I, I, mean, I caught sturgeon when I worked for Idaho Fishing Game. We were, we were able to set trot lines for it and little yeah. set lines. I just so I got some like eight nine footers thing, and I'm just Dude. like, what in the hell yeah, is those that? Those things are wild. Yeah, I got my my old bow fishing boats back in Minnesota. When my dad's friend's sons bought it from me, so we can go snag it and go drive yeah. back out and go shoot some shoot some paddlefish. That would be fun. Maybe and a cool video. Just the saying. other thing is you stay at Brady's house. You get to sneak out in the morning early, and Brady's just passed that on the couch. That's like, good old asleep. Brady. The couch. Yeah. I was, I was Brady's a couch, couch sleeper. It, You're it not even it, married, bro. You're sleeping on the it, couch. It comes it, from my dad. My dad, when he was younger, we'd always watch TV together, and he'd always fall asleep on the couch and wake up at like 3, 4 in the morning and then go, go upstairs. Yeah. Or 3, 4 in the morning, he'd usually just start working. Up, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I nip down to grab my keys. The TV's still on. I like peek over. Brady's got one leg kind of hanging off the couch. He's yeah. just passed out. <laughs> my couch is really nice to sleep on those giant. shitty blanket. And get pulled over his legs and he's Bruh. just asleep. You're not even kicked out of your master and that's how you're living? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was giggling. Well, if you go to my house right now, I told Trey, like, I'm in the middle of all these different hunts so it's like gear yeah. to destroy. Like, even like, if you go upstairs yeah. to my master bed right now, like, there's just gear and like clothes laid all over the place that I have I stuff to put away and crazy. hunting clothes. Yeah, I decided and, to stay last night because we had some stuff to do this morning and we didn't get done last night. And then we're gonna podcast, and so I just hit Brady up late. I'm like, "Hey, can I just crash in your bed? Your your guest, your bed, yeah. <laughs> yeah, in your bed with your you? Bed. <laughs> <laughs> big Specify spoon, this. big spoon, little spoon. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I was kind of giggling. And then he's like, "Oh man, my house is such a mess. It's just a disaster. He's it's like a gear bomb went off in it." And I was like, "All right." So then I got there later. He'd already got home, and it's like. Clean. It's Spick and span. Yeah, it's decent. I'm like, do you want to see what a dirty house looks like? Come to my house with three kids. I mean, there's <laughs> shit everywhere every day. But I mean, uh, like upstairs where my uh, row machine is, I still have my raft hanging out from when I got back from Alaska, and that's now a month and a half ago. The you're oars are still hunts. you don't want to deal the with. The oars that. are still sitting there. Yeah, it was tidy. I'll give him that. So that fishing hooks hanging around. Brady's mm. just back from an elk hunt. We had a chance to look at his uh, elk yesterday. 
That's Phenomenal fun. bowl. Really cool bowl. Squirt it out. Yeah. Do, you want, do you want to talk score or you don't care? Uh, it's a big bowl. Whatever. Big I'll bowl. say it's just a cool bowl. This it's is a big awesome bowl. bowl. Yeah. Biggest bowl he saw, I think. We looked at all the video, all the bowls. All, that he all they did just go from my from summer. You know, I, I, I talked about Instagram. I put in nine days of scouting. So that's basically that's a lot of weekends. Yeah, burned up of just running up there. That's a long drive up and back. Mm-hmm. Usually two, or sometimes I could sneak away a third day. And I, I guarantee you, that's the biggest bowl I saw the whole entire time, which is a cool thing to say. How many days did you hunt? Five. Five. Nine days of scouting. Not obviously right before the hunt, and then. Five and you days. ran elk every day. Every day. It's good to That's have cool. an event. Yeah, I was, mean, it's good to have an elk tag. Damn it. You well, did it again. I know, my bad. It's, it's good you to have an elk tag. yourself good, quick, good, Yeah, good to have an elk tag. I mean, if, you, if you're smart, you can put two and two together. Yeah. Yeah. No, that was awesome. Yeah, it was a phenomenal hunt. It, was, it's, it makes you feel like, like I've told before, like you feel like you're a really good glasser when you're glassing up bulls because they're just so giant. <laughs> you're just like, oh, there's one. Oh, there's one. Oh, there's yeah. one. Like Especially when, late season because they get actually, those those big late bulls get so blonde. Yeah, they get that long winter coat. They're starting yeah. to put it on and they just turn blonde. It's actually yeah. funny on my stone sheep hunt. That's what I like. Stones are they blend in real well with the shale. Yeah, they're I just mean, pepper. Stone sheep for a reason. Yep. They got a stone cape. It's like we'd be looking for sheep and I'd just turn around and be like, "There's some elk. There's an elk. Oh, there's a bull. Like just yeah. turn. Are you seeing elk? Oh, tons of elk. Really? Tons of elk. No and I'm kidding. just like, there's some, there's some. There's I didn't know that. That's wild. Yeah. Are those Rockies? I don't, or? they're smaller. They're yeah. different. They're smaller. Gotcha. Um, yeah, when I was in BC, we saw some elk, but they were, Yeah. I didn't even think about that. They're a smaller breed. Were they bugling? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I didn't but even like, think about that. You know, the sheep were so hard to see. I just turned around and be like, damn, I can pick up Na- some elk. Naked though. eye. Like, I got these things. I got picked no. out. It was a haystack moving. That's yeah. A, yeah. I'm excited for our hunt series talk coming up. I know me we have too. so many hunts we got to talk about. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Brady's having a pretty epic year. We looked <laughs> through a bunch of his hunt photos last night. I, that's mostly what I did is just sit there on the couch and have Brady scroll through his photos and looked at all pretty the different epic. hunts. Brady's having a pretty epic year. Man, Run through them real quick from right. January 1st. Since January. Okay. So audit, we went audit hunting first. Mm-hmm. Killed a great one. So I killed a whopper of an audit. I killed the mountain lion on that hunt as well. Mm-hmm. And then it rolled into spring bear, killed a black bear. And then in the summer, killed an oryx, mm-hmm. my dad, and a couple of my friends. Then I killed a moose, whopper of a bull moose. Mm-hmm. And then rolled in now with the bull elk. Damn. Dude, the thing is, six, got, a, six animals already. That's and it's pretty good. October and, 31st. And they've all been really good, good animals. Yeah, like they've, they've all been quality. Yeah. yeah, like nice, mature animals. All yeah, like my, my odd ad, dream odd ad. I told Brady last night, this is the best year you're ever going to have. So it's all yeah. downhill from here, bud. It is. And he's like, whoa, whoa. Don't, no, don't <laughs> get crazy. <laughs> I got big plans. And I'm like, no. Well, this the thing is, is, thing is, is I, like, we is were, a hell of a year, though. We, we were talking, though. Like, you and I both trail. We carry a metric shit ton of points. You know, it was Western states. And some states were, were okay with waiting forever to draw tags. But I'm getting to a point where I've waited forever to draw tags. And yeah, you're in I'm a just going to start to draw them. You're in That's a good what I was spot. telling Omar. You're in a really good yeah. spot. I was telling Omar because he was like, what, you know, what are you doing next year? And you start looking at it and you're like, you know, I don't know, 10, 12, 15 years. Seems like a lot and it is. But as you get older, time passes pretty quickly, it seems like. And, and then you all, get there. all of a sudden you're like, oh, I've got 12 points. I've and got 15 points. all these points. different states. Yeah, yeah, and I've been playing the game and all of a sudden like I've still been hunting the whole time. Because yep, you, you can hunting. only hunt so much, you know. Yeah. But then you've got opportunities that just start to build up, and I think that's the biggest case. I mean, it might seem overkill to apply in all the Western states and build points, but you just consistently do it and do it, and you can pretty well guarantee yourself a decent tag. Once well, you're you gonna your, you're gonna your, have your, your a 40s. span of just the prime time, yeah. which is where Brady sits yeah, right now. You, you're in your prime of tags. drawn tags. Brady's and then in I his got prime ladies. <laughs> yeah, that Ooh, too. That is, that is true. <laughs> I was talking about hunting prime, but we'll oh, go there too. Oh, yeah, gotcha. <laughs> And I carry a metric ton of, of elk points, which is kind of funny too. So it's like I'm not. An, I mean, we'll just discuss admit it later. now publicly that you are an elk guy. No. Yeah, let's visit that real quick. How do you feel about it now? Uh, you, you hunt, you've hunted elk. You gave it a. It was a yeah, mus- this, this, this is this a muscle my... loader tag, spot and stock, good unit. You hunted elk. You you did it. You did it. Yeah, this is my fourth bull. Fourth bull elk I've killed. How do you feel about it? And I feel like I, I said it with Luke Your on the video bull before this though being. A yeah, raghorn. Raghorn, yeah. yeah. This is my first dream bull mm-hmm. ever. Like, yeah. This is a giant. Uh, I, I told Luke when we were like doing some recording and he was just candidly filming and I was like, you know, I respect elk a, a ton. I 
I give him a lot of respect. I, res- I feel like there's a butt coming. Here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, I respect him a lot. I enjoyed hunting him for what they are. I enjoyed the style of hunting. I enjoyed that I had a muzzle to sneak in and get close. I, I said before I went out there, I hope they're not bugling at all. I hope I never see hear a freaking bugle because I want those bulls to be on the top of the mountain. Nice. If the bulls are on the top of the mountain, I can kill them because that's my hunting style. Everyone knows I like to just get up nasty and steep in the mountains, and I, I wanted that part I of it. I honestly feel like I might get struck by lightning if you keep spitting this blasphemy. Yeah, I agree. So, so, you don't want an elk to bugle. It's the only time they're fun to hunt. I don't want all the eyes. <laughs> right. I, uh, I don't want to deal with all the cows. Yeah, I heard a couple. That, that ape and I bugled. No. Oh. Yeah, he was ripping out like just gnarly sounding bugles, which was which was pretty it, cool. It was cool. See, it was cool. Yeah, yeah. Getting but it's like detail. at the end of the day, though, like I will pick up tags for whatever I can pick up a tag for. So I am hunting elk right now. So yeah, sure, I'll say I, I, at the time I loved hunting elk. If I pick up a black bear tag, I love black bear hunting. If I pick up an animal tag, yeah, I love animal collect, hunting. Collectively, let's I just compare. Love, I'm just a mountain hunter. I just love hunting mountains. Do you like hunting elk now though better than like some of the others? <laughs> no, you like them better than hunting bear though for sure. <laughs> no. That's what you said last night. No. <laughs> <You're just kidding. laughs> you should have just left that way for a little bit. No. I mean, I love hunting them all, but like, they just, I'm glad other people love them for what they are. I mean, I'm, I'm really happy for people that actually love those. It's like, you know, some guys are blonde, like, like blondes. Some guys like brunettes. I'm a brunette guy. Popular thing is blondes. Mm. You like red meat, uh, yeah. dark haired women. What does Ron Swanson say? He's oh, a simple yeah. American man. He likes breakfast foods, Burnett women, and something else. Yeah. Red meat. <laughs> and, and red meat. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, no, they're, they're fun to hunt. Like, I, they, I do see why people love them, and I'm glad people love hunting them in the rut and all that. But it's like, <laughs> all right. I, I'd rather hunt them late season if I can hunt them. Like, I'm, the rest of my tags, I want to try to draw as late fair, season. Fair enough. I won't no, pu- that is not fair enough. I, w- I won't push you every week on it, but I did post hunt. I wanted to know. I'm like, the, definitely this pushed it over the over the top. It, it, well, it? I will say, since it's the biggest bull I ever killed, like, it was a special moment. Mm. Like, when I was up there before Luke got over to me, because I was, you know, stalking a little bit, which we'll talk about in another podcast. But, like, I was mentioning my dad, and it, like, it hit home. It's the biggest like, animal you've ever killed. Yeah. They're not easy hunting. No, it was a very, it was a very good challenge. I love the challenge because I feel like now... I might be a little better hunter because of the hunt I did because it was an open side muzzle. I did have to get close. I'd have to change my tactics. I'd have to open my world to different hunting styles in a way. Like, sure, it's kind of similar to hunting mule. They're misglassing and putting on a stock, but like trying to figure out where the eyes are. Okay, where is there a raghorn bulls near this? How am I going to sneak in? Like, so let me ask you a question. This is one. This is this is the this is the difference for me. Hunting mule deer, I think, is boring. Mostly boring. Oh. Because you're going to sit days, mental grind, days, days yeah. on end looking for a buck. Yep, looking for a buck, trying to dig him out. Like, nope, didn't see him today. Next yeah. day, didn't see him today. Oh, third day, saw him for 20 minutes. Then he went over a ridge, didn't see him again. Because they're regal, they're ghosts. But elk, you see an elk all the time. Like, yeah. just from a pure enjoyment standpoint, you have to admit it was hun- more, enjoyable. Hun- more enjoyable. Boom. No. Got him. <laughs> I'm trying to got him. Move him on to the topic at hand. Yeah, I don't know. We'll talk. We can talk about it later. <laughs> and this is mule deer rock. This is the biggest antlered or horned animal you've ever killed. Like if you just go off of general scores and things like that. Like moose. a moose is big, but moose. he doesn't score that much. Yeah, that's true. The way you, you know score I mean? things. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The way you, it's so. I mean, this is your biggest. Biggest. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're glad that's you. Cool. We're that's glad really you had cool. a successful hunt. It was everything I wanted in a hunt, and I killed the biggest bull I ever saw on the whole whole year of scouting so i think that's a that's a good win that's a big win that's a huge win i was just willing to grind it out that's, that's such a good feeling when you put in that much time that much say, effort that, that's and, the most gratifying and you feeling. killed the mm-hmm. biggest one you saw that's I, I, awesome. I walked away thinking it was the coolest thing ever and it's yeah it's pretty cool i look at that bulb like it's in my office right now here go and i shut the door because i don't want anyone touching it yeah <laughs> you're like, just in there fondling it i'm protecting it yeah <laughs> <laughs> i might bring it home yeah you know no, let's uh, cool. hang out with it for a little bit before bringing the taxidermist because I'm shoulder mountain it trail, by the way. You guys I knew know you that. would. Yeah. When's your deer hunt? I knew you would. Uh, so yeah, mid November, right? Yeah, November 10th starts November 10th, so I'm 10 days out. So we we should do recaps after that. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, that would be that. kind of the, kind of the wrap up. I yeah, think. Yeah, we'll do and all then, recaps. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll get into stone sheep hunt, some deer Perfect. hunts. Uh, you know, talk maybe some more details about moose and elk and odd and orcs and orcs, whatever yeah, else yeah. you killed. <laughs> we got a lot of crazy <laughs> adventures. Else. Yeah, but today we're gonna talk. Uh, Kind of an interesting topic. I guess before we get going, maybe we hit promo. Yeah, same with promo. You want me to do it? Yeah. Okay. Promo. You guys can sign up uh, for Go Hunt Insider account. 
You can sign up for Go Hunt Maps. You can use the promo code podcast. That's P-O-D-C-A-S-T. Sometimes I like to try spell things out to see if I can still spell a little. Oh, good. <laughs> uh, so use the promo code podcast. If you do that, you're going to get points back in the Go Hunt gear shop. Uh, point equals a dollar, so one point, one dollar. Keep it nice and simple. Uh, we are moving, as we kind of talked about a little bit, into more of that research, <laughs> which is hard to believe. But you've got uh, some states coming up. You've got over-the-counter archery deals, deer sales going on in Arizona on uh, November 2nd. <laughs> Two days from now? That's going to be when this goes live. Yeah, that's right. The day this goes live, if you want to buy an over-the-counter archery deer tag for Arizona going into next year, that's the day to do it. Yep. And you've also got Idaho. I haven't heard any changes to Idaho system. So the plan is right now, I think, still December 1st. Still probably December 1st. Yep. Play that game. So those over-the-counter permits go on sale. It's a great time to do some research in those two states and see if you want to pick up a permit. It's the best time right now to do research for I idaho agree. i agree like yeah. this is the time to jump into right 2.0 and sure. figure it out your list because you know that day comes some of those units that you want are going to get sold out whether it's an elk zone or a mule deer unit yep. so you have to have the backup plan and jumping into filtering 2.0 right now you'll have your plan start marking those down start saving those units start adding them to your hunt folders of like potential units you might want to pick up a tag for yeah and then for folks that are still hunting, you still got what third season, uh, Colorado, fourth season, Colorado. Yep. Uh, guys in the whitetail woods are just getting excited. Yeah, all oh, the huge yeah. front pushed into all yeah. over right here before Halloween. I'm so jealous. That's right. Yeah, so now get, now would be a great time still to sign up for Go Hunt Maps. Hundred percent. Yeah, you can do a lot of stuff right now. So use the promo code podcast. Mm-hmm. So all right. So last week uh, we did a little social media post. Um, I'd looked at a new proposal from Utah Division of Wildlife Resources. We said that we would do a podcast on it. We kind of run through that. Uh, so today we're going to talk mostly mule deer in the state of Utah and talk some proposals that those guys have come up with. Those are going to make their rounds through the RAC, which is the Regional Advisory Council meeting process. That's the public's opportunity to uh, listen to the biologists present these proposals and then also offer public feedback. Uh, You can also submit feedback, and we can drop a link in the episode. So anybody that wants to submit feedback online, um, you can do that there. Um, I should should mention, too, that the first racks are starting here in November. So basically it's November 8th, I think, through the end of the month, right before Thanksgiving. Yep. Yep, so first racks, November 8th, that's the northern region, central rack, the ninth, southern region rack, which we're going to talk primarily about today. And just, just to be clear, non-residents can... can yeah, everybody, everybody for yeah. sure. Anybody yeah. that's interested in hunting in Utah, yep. yeah. Again, it's like one of those things we always talk about, too. Even if you never think you're going to hunt Utah or like Washington with their bear thing, like... If you want to think about hunting in the future, uh, get involved. It's Submit your comments be right now. engaged in hunting just as a whole. Yeah, learn about these things. Read yeah. other people's comments. Figure out why it's a hot-button topic for certain yeah. things and get, get involved. Yeah, and I think we're going to offer some opinions on the proposals. I, I definitely have mine. We're going to probably talk some history of some of the management strategies that are being proposed. Everybody's going to have an opinion, and that's the thing is like a lot of wildlife management – I mean, you try to apply good biology and good science into managing hunting, but largely it's socially driven. A lot of it is socially driven. Very socially driven. So how you hunt, where you get to hunt, with what weapons you get to hunt, a lot of that comes down to the public and your feedback, and (laughs) you've got to get involved. So I would say, like, regardless of any opinion that I offer, Brady, Lorenzo offers today, irregardless of all that, I don't know if it's regardless or irregardless, Ooh, that's is a tough one. That's a tough one. As a uh, word guy, that <laughs> struggles with me too. Yeah. I did not do well in English, that may, so I don't even know where <laughs> that, to start. That's a tough one for me. But I would say, like, get involved. Show up to a rack meeting if you can. If you can't, submit your feedback. And I think that's probably the take home of this entire podcast. If I could like push people in one direction, it's just that get involved. Yeah. Because if not, it'll just fly by the night, and whatever gets enacted gets enacted, and you're at the mercy of whatever is done. I don't want to sound maybe negative <clears throat> about the getting involved thing, but I think you should also get educated a little yeah, bit. Le- sure. First, first and re- foremost. First, you should definitely read <clears throat> things rather than going off just basically emotions in your head because, mm. I mean, we'll get, probably get to a little bit. I read, read a lot of these comments so far. Like I was out elk hunting, so I, I missed a lot of this, mm-hmm. but I've been catching up. A lot of these comments are pretty in, insane to me that 
they're all this supportive of all this and they don't really understand the true meaning of it. Cause I think a lot of hunters jump on a bandwagon of thinking some of the things are great when they're really in our, my, a, in a my lot opinion, of the, a lot of responses are emotionally based. Yeah. Emotionally yeah. based. And it's like, do some research, dive into some biology reports, figure out these studies they've done before and educate yourself a little bit on what you're going to be commenting about. Cause that'll only help you have a better opinion on it yeah. rather than just saying like, Oh yeah, I agree with everything. And I get the emotion. I get, I'm I get emotion, I get emotion. I'm emotional get about in. some of them too. I mean, some of them yeah. are on units that I really love units yeah. that I, that I hunt. I'm, I'm, I have emotional response to that. I don't, I don't like it, but you know, you have to also objectively kind of step back and look at it and think, why is this being proposed? What are mm. the potential outcomes for this proposal? If they yeah. go through with it, and I'm not the most educated in a lot of this stuff either. So I've been like, okay, I want to dig into some harvest data yeah. and see what the trends are and see maybe what their justification is before I just blanket statement like, oh, yeah, I want this because of yeah. you know, maybe my personal reasons. And, and then let that guide your feedback. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I like, do yeah. some research. Like, yeah. And also, also, I would say don't feel bad about... Uh, don't feel bad about just like offering your opinion. Yeah. Like I'm going to say, you know, that Mount Dutton, it's one of my favorite units to hunt Southern Utah. We're talking restrict, we'll get into it, but we're talking restricted weapons, recurve longbow. I don't like it. I like to compound bow hunt. Objectively, if you look at that, you're like, oh, I could see why they were doing it. Maybe it's not so bad. Maybe it'll do some good things. Subjectively, I want to hunt with my compound bow. So that's going to be my feedback. Yeah. I want to hunt with my compound bow on that unit. That's my personal opinion. I feel okay offering it. So I would tell people, be okay with submitting your opinion, what you yeah. want. Mm -hmm. And that's, I mean, it's kind of the way we, uh, you know, we guide wildlife management. So anyway, do you want to, do, you want to jump in and just talk about these? We should just jump in right at the, right at the top. High level. Do yeah. you want to get Let's the, jump in high should level. we get the easy ones out of the way first? Yeah. So I would say, uh, first and foremost, let's talk muzzle loaders, scopes oh, on muzzle loaders. I know Brady loves this one. Yep. So Utah's proposing to remove magnified scopes, scopes from muzzle loaders, and going to iron sights or peep sight yeah. only. So they made this change recently to allow scopes. What was it, 2016, 2017? Mm -hmm. So since then, we've had we've scopes. Had scopes on muzzle loaders. And these are not just, you know, your three to nine red fields. These are, you can use full-on turrets. Everything goes. Whatever scopes. you want. Whatever you want. 1X, you can have a 35X magnification on a muzzle loader. Anything goes. What do you think? So this is, I think it's, people are going to be surprised by my opinion here. And based on one of the comments on the article, some guy was like, oh yeah, not everyone can have a tricked out muzzleloader like Brady that can shoot long range. It's basically a single shot rifle. Mm -hmm. And I said publicly before a lot, like these muzzleloaders that you can use in Utah are single shot rifles. It's not a muzzleloader. I am on the side that, you know, muzzleloader hunt should be a little more primitive which might surprise people because I love a rifle. I love, mm -hmm. you know, shooting long range rifle practice. Like geeking under, out on under it. what though? Why? Like are, what? I, what do you think, Lorenzo? What do you, do you, muzzle loader? I'm, I'm, I guess I'm, I should jump to you before I go to him. Yeah. Go ahead. I mean, like to, to, to me, you know, like I see both sides. Okay. So the scope thing to me is going to, you know, you're, you're not going to probably wound as many animals. Cause so like open sight muzzle is hard. I've done it multiple times and it's or, hard. Or, or are you? Because now you're, you're, you're baiting somebody into taking a 400 yard shot with a muzzle letter because they have a scope on it. Yep, exactly. Cause I think a lot, that's why I, I was going to comment to one of these people on the article. Like I think a lot of people think they can throw technology on a weapon and they're good to crazy distances. They don't do the practice. So it's a crutch. Mm -hmm. It's just like, like rifle hunting. Everyone thinks like, Oh yeah, I have a rifle tag. I'm going to shoot five days before the season and I'll be good to go. Where archers are really good at shooting all year. Most of them. There's, there's people who go to the bow shop the week before and like, hey, I need a new string <laughs> yeah. and haven't sighted my bow in. Mm -hmm. But it seems like more bow hunters practice all year. It's like a lifestyle mm. where a lot of rifles and muzzleloader guys, like especially like muzzleloaders are the biggest one. Like people don't shoot all year with the muzzleloader. So they might have something that potentially can shoot further that they're not practicing as much for. And so, yeah, putting a scope on it could wound more things like, oh, yeah, now I can shoot 400 yards because mm -hmm. I see these guys doing it on YouTube and on the Internet and people talking about long range muzzleloaders and inlines and black horn two and nine and all this fancy stuff. But they don't put the practice in. You know what's interesting? So I looked at a I looked at a harvest or not a harvest survey, but a survey that the DWR did, particularly about this topic about muzzle loaders and scopes. Mm -hmm. And they were able to the survey, they were able to break these people out by people that were muzzle loader hunters. So they applied for muzzle loader tags. They shot muzzle these guys are muzzle loader hunters, right? Yep. Like that's their jam. Just like you have bow hunters, you had muzzle loader hunters. And then you had people that were like, I'll hunt with a muzzleloader 
if I draw a tag draw or if tag. I get into the dedicated hunter program or, you know, I'm, I'm opportunistic. Right. Yep. And then you have people that are like, nah, I don't hunt with the muzzle or I don't know much about them. Maybe if I had a tag, I would try it. Right. Mm-hmm. So the one it was really interesting. It was largely people said 200 yards was kind of like, I wouldn't shoot, you know, 200 yards is kind of my limit. Right. Yeah. But then one of the questions was like, how likely would you be to shoot out to 400, 400 yards for a muzzleloader, right? And I'm paraphrasing this, this isn't the exact question, but this is kind of the- Are we the, talking scopes on here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And this is kind of the, you know, the, I'm paraphrasing, but this is the, you know, the gist of the question, right? Um, muzzleloader hunters, people identify as muzzleloader hunters, less likely to shoot at 400 yards than non-muzzleloader hunters. Yeah. So those people that are just like, fly by the night every once in a while they're like 400 yards yeah maybe i might i might do it guys but guys that know their equipment yeah because the other other people don't know the ballistics they don't know what their bullets doing they don't know (laughs) they don't know the wind drift of it they haven't practiced enough so they know their limitation and they know it very well i thought that was really interesting i'm like isn't this telling just it's telling to the educated knowing the right thing to do and that's why i think it's kind of scary though because largely that's your base like the more people are going out in the field opportunistically they don't really know their equipment and they're more likely to take a 400 yard shot than somebody that knows their equipment Mm -hmm. but like to me i i do enjoy the challenge of that open site peep site style as long as it's still like an an inline at least Mm -hmm. like like going way back to super traditional muzzle loaders like okay that 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 i think to me is almost like the whole recurve side of it where you're opening the door for a lot more wounding because you have a lot more things can go wrong which is fine. There's we'll, no, we'll get into yeah, that, there's really good yeah. people with recurves, really good people with like traditional muzzle loaders. But I mean, I'm I, I'm probably I'm going to say publicly, I'm okay with the just change going back. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's we were talking last night. I don't think there's a st- statistically significant harvest success increase since scopes have been yeah. added. They're saying well. three, three to four percent, somewhere in that neighborhood, three and a half percent. It sounded like statewide they were killing average maybe four hundred more bucks across yep. all tags with scoped muzzle loaders, And then it's, 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 no one can ever figure this out, but how many more were wounded because of a scope mm-hmm. or how many more were wounded back in the day because of a peep site, because they took shots that they shouldn't be taking. Yeah. So you always have those variables going back and forth. And like you just said, that little yeah. study or whatever shows that inexperienced muzzle loader hunters are probably those people who are going <laughs> to shoot longer range, which yeah. might actually wound some things. Last but, time I muzzle loader hunted, I had a guy take a crack at a buck that I was putting stock on. I was probably 110 yards from this buck working through the PJ and a guy, took a crack at about 325 <laughs> over kind of off, diag- off yeah. diagonal to me, open sights. He, he didn't hit it. <laughs> but, the, <laughs> uh, but the thing yeah. I find interesting, though, a guy like you, Trail, mm-hmm. you've killed some muzzleloader bucks. Mm-hmm. And since the muzzleloader change has been into effect in Utah to put scopes on, what have you still shot with? Yeah, just my stain one X scope. One, one X scope, yeah. So you've never changed, and you're still successful. Yeah, I never did. And I think it's just a... I mean, it's just a personal choice. Yeah. I I, I kind of like the challenge of getting close. And, and to me, too, the reason like I'm kind of on board with going, you know, back a little bit is the draw odds increase. You could have a <laughs> potentially draw odds increase, like the New Mexico did. I yeah. think in future years, when people see how hard it is, people start talking how hard it is. Yeah, they had a banger year in New Mexico. A lot of big bowls because good moisture and everything. So I asked the division, did you see initially the first year you went to magnified scopes on muzzleloaders a a bump in or a dip, I should say, in draw odds. So those muzzleloader tags becoming harder to draw because now people could use scopes. They said for a year, definitely. Yeah. You can see percentage, it on And you can look at it on our product and see the bump. They said they felt like it plateaued out, but I would definitely say there were more people. I know a lot of people that were, uh, especially for like limited entry species, you're talking limited entry deer, elk, mm-hmm. antelope, those kinds of things. I definitely saw people that had, 18, 19 points, they'd been chasing an early rifle tag or a late rifle tag, and they're like, yeah, maybe I can draw a muzzleloader tag. I'm much more willing to do that now because I can shoot a magnified scope. Mm-hmm. So I definitely think you impact the draw odds. Yeah. I think that's a good point. I think you, you make a distinction between it being a its own unique weapon at that point if you remove the scopes, and I think you probably will see more people not apply for a muzzleloader tag because they can't shoot a scope on it and go back to applying for rifle yeah and i think too it's, it's a lot of things in life you always have that certain groups that are gonna be loud and vocal about certain you know gear regulation changes like you know my dad you know back in the day he was a professional drag racer like traveling all over the united states you know one world championship all mm-hmm. that stuff 
and his class was always being limited. Like, they're like, oh yeah, you guys are going so fast. We're going to start limiting you because you're going faster than everyone else for whatever reason. You have to have better technology. We'll put governor on that. Yeah. So they try to try to put <laughs> rules and regulations to limit people to make it more fair for everyone else. But then all of a sudden you realize that's not the right way to go. And so they abolish that and go back to something else. Like they're constantly trying to tweak and change things for a small portion of people who are being the loudest, mm-hmm. even though these other people are super dedicated. Like, sure. Yeah. It's might be whatever you have better gear, you have better crew, you have better tech, but you're yeah. like figuring out how to make things work better. And you're, you know, trying to be more successful that way. So I think there's a lot of things in life. I can think about those examples of like mm-hmm. people try to change things when yeah, know, sometimes yeah. status quo is the way to go. But the muzzleloader thing is interesting because you could do the, like the same thing, compound versus recurve, but we'll get into it in a little bit. Yeah. Like, do you feel strong? I don't, I don't know what's right. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think they should be limited. I don't, I don't think you should have free reign on optics and scopes. Mm. It's a primitive weapon. It's a primitive hunt. I think there should be some aspect of it still being primitive. And then I also think about it just in a really simplistic mind, right? Like just think about it. It's very simple. Boil it down to the simplest thing. Archery, right? Your effective range is, call it 60. Mm-hmm. Muzzler, your effective range is 150, 200. Rifle, your effective range is you know, four or 500, whatever yeah. it is. So it's, it's nice that those effective ranges grow as these weapons change and seasons change. And obviously you would like to see these seasons reflect, you know, the, the habits of the animal during those times. Like obviously hunting mule deer in August is a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. You see a lot of deer, they're very active, but yeah. there's, there's a reason why you're not hunting them with a gun that time of year, yeah. right? You all wish you could, but there's a reason why you don't. Yeah, our general season used muzzleloader used to be in November in Utah, and they got rid of it because it was just like these animals are so vulnerable. Yeah, yeah. and in it's fact. like that effective range that far in November, like mm-hmm. right. Um, but anyways, I, I just had a very simple thought. I, I'm I like them to be primitive at least to some aspect. Like you get into the compound recurve, compound is still a primitive ish weapon right it like still is hard it still is very hard. your effective range is is lessened like it's not primitive where mm-hmm. you know how it in the grand sense of the word neither is a muzzle or now mm-hmm. either with a pointed yeah. sabot and yeah, one I, of their rifling barrels now and all kinds of stuff right so like there is growth to it on the technology side but it still has to be treated uh, in my opinion i like them to be treated right like as a separate season as a separate thing a different as thing. its own thing own category right? and i think everyone can agree if you can put bias aside and emotion aside and all this stuff which you you agreed with as well brady a, a muzzle loader like that in utah it's a single shot rifle single shot rifle it is not a muzzle loader anymore as good as everything else has gotten and now you're putting these cut turrets on them and yeah i can lay shoot. down and smack a steel target at 450 all day yeah. long it's like it's just not what it's grown to a certain certain point right of the round ball now to a pointed Mm sabot and rifled barrels and all that stuff but there's got to be a cap at some point on those you know what i mean to play devil's advocate do you think like it's is it warranted based on just the fact that the the harvest is only three percent greater i think it's the public perspective again it's a social thing it's a social thing like you think these guys like oh they have more money than me so they're going to put more time in their scope they can buy a custom muzzleloader and they're (laughs) shooting all these big giant bucks well it might look like that on like a social media side of it but you think of the general population, like I think a lot of people just still have average muzzle loaders and they're fine with it and they're happy and they're going out and doing their own thing. But yeah. it's, a few people are being loud because they're seeing certain yeah. people being successful with it. So they think it's outrageously successful or enhancing it. And yeah, it's a scope gun. You can, you know, a lot of people I saw in the comments, they said, yeah, the scope gun helped us kill this bull. We shot a bull at 550 yards with a scope yeah. muzzle loader. And right. one of the comments on the article, like, this is, that is an that's interesting pretty crazy thing, to though. say. Mm-hmm. But it is, it is interesting that, you know, the data speaks to it not really changing. Not really much. changing. Not, not statistically much. significant. Like, and then now my personal side, you want to get into personal beliefs of and, and regulation. And, and I should and, say that was for general season deer. You're not talking elk because I think if you went to elk, I, I, would, would, wildly I, would, think I would think that people are more successful more on yeah. elk with yeah. a scoped muzzle loader. Oh, I would think. Yep. Yeah. Again, I'm not, I don't have data in front of me, but that's just my gut. gut mm-hmm. feel. And again, a lot of this is just how people feel. Yeah, it's, yeah. The, it's the emotional reaction, <laughs> yeah. right? And that's what my emotional reaction to the data only being three or four percent. It's like, well, my personal belief in government regulation is don't fucking touch it if there's not a problem. Mm-hmm. It's like, why just why are you adding problems when there's no problem? Right? Yeah. Like you're just adding shit. But, you know, my immediate emotional reaction is like, 
we got to cap the effective range to some point just for conservation, just for, I don't know, right? But then the data speaks otherwise on conservation of the animals. It's not really doing much. I kind of, I like it for a couple, I'm kind of like on the fence. Like this one could go either way for me and I wouldn't feel emotional one way or the other. I'm kind of like on, I'm, I'm on the fence, but I do like the fact that we would be more in line with other yeah. Western states. That's so what I want to talk about. Yeah. We, we, yeah. Trail and I were talking That's about that sitting on the couch it. last night. Yeah. yeah, New Mexico got rid of scopes. Uh, yeah. You still have a few states that are that it's legal, but for the most part, most states do not allow. Yeah, you got Nevada's open sites, Colorado's open sites. Yeah, yeah. and it is kind of nice to be more in line, I guess, more. I think anytime I would love to see a lot of the states, to be honest, like just get more on, in line as far as like draws and the way everything goes, just make it oh, less oh, complicated. Man. But yeah. that's a stretch. As long as you pick the right system, maybe. But um, yeah. I, I do like that from that perspective. And then I, I like the fact that it would be like its own distinct weapon type, yep. its own season. I do think that putting, although again, numbers don't statistically show that it's like that much more effective than open sites, but I do like it not being a, single shot being an extra rifle hunt if you will yeah and, and then the thing too like if you're a guy who if you love shooting long-range muzzle loaders if that's mm. your jam you love a scope you love you know everything about it you can use that in most during states during, during the rifle yeah. hunt you can still use it in utah during any weapon season so if you, you can to. still yeah, you, can, you can still do it yeah so like you have that ability to do it but yeah you're going to be competing with other single shot rifle guy. Or yeah. Mo- yeah. You know, Multiple mag- shot rifle Magazines. Guys. Yeah. yeah. Mine's a single shot. But, but selfishly, man, like, you know, the draw odds will be more in favor yeah. for, of a guy who's willing to hunt open side. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's just, you, we saw the pop in Utah when it's mm-hmm. was legal with, with scopes. Like, yep. I like the effect of range being, I like it being a harder hunt because it's going to, it's going to cap out some people who aren't willing to do that in draw odds. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I mean, this is one of those ones that's like uh, a lot of it's just based on feel. Yeah. Because statistically, there's not any real reason to go one way or the yeah. other. Not significant anyway. Mm-hmm. In my little brain, I just like the step of effective ranges from bow to muzzle loader to yeah. rifle. And, and like just simple mind. Yeah. It's, it is a tough one though. Yeah. It's a tough one to think about because then I guess we're basically touching on other weapons. Like you talk about the same thing of rifles. You can talk about the same thing about compound bows. Mm-hmm. Like what you limit on those, but like. I, don't I mean, know. look, I know very, there's somebody very close to me shot a buck of a lifetime this year from 450 yards out of his bed with a scoped rifle, with a scoped so, muzzle loader. Sorry. In his bed. In his bed. Yeah. Just stoned him dead that's, cold. Yeah. That's a poke. <laughs> practiced now, now practiced like a madman all through the summer when he found out he drew this tag, once in a lifetime tag. He was the guy who was chasing rifle. Yeah. Now with muzzle loader, he jumped into muzzle loader so he could actually draw the tag. Ended up drawing it, killed absolute buck of a lifetime, 450 yards out of his bed. Just you, stone cold dead. Since you what's this since you know him personally, do you think he would have done the same thing if it was open sites only? I, I he would have killed the buck. He but would have he, still he would, killed the buck. For, but, but just, not, not, he, not in that draw, exact situation. But would he try to draw that muzzle loader tag or would he have probably held out for a rifle because he had so many that's points? A great, that's a great question. Um probably would have held out for a rifle. Maybe eventually, he'd be like, I'm sick yeah. of it. I'm going to jump over. But yeah. like right now in his life, he probably would have waited a little bit. Yeah, he's he's very in shape. Um, he probably he could have. He's older guy, very in shape though, and probably could have waited a little longer. But I mean, he just took his chance to draw the tag, and it it comes before the rifle, so you have first pick. First right? pick. Like, that's that's a, what I like about on my hunt. Those limited entries in mm-hmm. Utah. He's got his first pick before rifles were in there, and he, man, there's so you can see. Well, I mean, I can see. I do. Both sides. I do want to say though, he practiced. Like yeah. Brady Miller status through the summer, sure. he was so good with that muzzle letter going into that hunt. He knew everything about it. Yeah, part of me also thinks like maybe, maybe spreading out people across muzzle loaders with a scope on them, and you know guys that would normally hunt with a rifle, maybe you're gaining some guys through the system quicker than you would yeah, otherwise. Kind of thinning out yeah. the rifle. Yeah, maybe hunts. maybe yeah. if you go back to this, you take scopes off muzzle loaders. Maybe those guys jump back into rifle hunts, and it makes those hunts harder to jump. draw. Yep. Yep. Yeah. There's, there's a lot, lot there. There's, there's a lot so much there. things to think there's about. There's a lot to consider and think about. And I, I think, I guess what it ultimately boils down to is I can't really find, I can't really find a good reason, one or the other, to be honest. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, this is definitive. Like, this yeah. is what should happen other than, other than the fact that it's like, you know, how you feel. And how then feel. maybe it being like its own distinct season yeah. and weapon type. Mm-hmm. And then to, for the data purposes, like how the data doesn't really speak speak that it's the 
Look, that deer still would have died. It was in his bed in the middle of the day. Sure. Yeah, he, he, had cut, it. he had to cut 250 yards, yeah. had the wind, like, and he's a very good hunter. It yeah. it's, he still would have killed the buck. Yeah, I mean, you say 3%, 3%, 3%. It's 400 deer that died that, Across that may state. not have died yeah. if you had open sights. So who knows? I mean, you extrapolate that over five years. Yeah, and not everybody's as good a hunter as sure. the story I'm talking about. So maybe that buck would have lived in other scenarios. Yeah, and, and then I'd like to think of, too, like it's hard to figure out all this data, though, like, were those extra deer that got killed at three percent? Was that because of great weather during those yeah, seasons? There's a lot of factors. There's a lot, lot, of factors. A lot, a lot of more variables. factors there. Were they just <laughs> yeah. happy to shoot anything, and they would have shot anything anyway? Or yep. were they holding over something yeah. bigger? Were they were they more mature deer taken? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Were they just average deer? You know, two three year old bucks. Yeah. There's a lot of factors that could go into it. So it's hard to just say like, oh yeah, four hundred more deer. It's That's inter a big interesting one or a small number, really whatever is. it could be. Yeah, but regardless, if you got feelings, strong feelings one way or the other, <laughs> show up or submit Same. your feedback. Because yeah. yeah. I have a feeling because it was always open sights or one power. Then we had a change. Scopes on muzzle loaders. We went to it. We were there for maybe, what, six, seven years, I guess, at this point. Uh, and I think we're going to go one way or the other. And I think I feel pretty definitively this might be kind of it for a while. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and, the, and so this is the change of like no scopes. So the one X is going to go away. So the division said they were open to potentially the one power stuff. One power, maybe because <laughs> open to it for discussion. But they basically said they would like. I think ultimately what they would like is to to just be one or the other. Like you have no scope, yeah, or iron sights or peep sights. Because if and you have, have that be the definition, if you have iron or peep compared to one X, one X is a <clears throat> has a giant leap up in advantage. That's like a giant you're pulling leap. all that light in. I'm thinking I, about my my I bullet. One is, is that I think your actual natural vision is greater than one time, one but one power. But but, but you do have crosshairs. Yeah, you're, but and you're pulling and that light. light. And but light. The, the light. Mm -hmm. I, I could put a, the best of the best one X scope known to man that gathers all the light, and I could have taken a shot at that bull then that mm -hmm. I shot because I had to pass him up because it was, too, before, it was too dark. Yeah. I had 35 minutes of shooting sure. light left, and I couldn't see through my my peep sight. I couldn't see through it at all. So the one X does had a lot of advantage. But the the bull so, still died. Bull still died. Bull, so I, I found him the next day with an open sight and shot him. Bull still died. Bull still died, but mm -hmm. he might have died the night before, though. Yeah. Might have died the night before. <laughs> yeah, you need get that extra feed to add on yeah. that muscle that makes yeah. more meat. But it yeah, is interesting. I, uh, I, it's like I said though. I just encourage people voice your opinions because I think once this one is decided, I don't think you're gonna probably see it up for debate for a while. So, what, 2017 to 2023. Was that five years? Six, Six years? years. Six years we're deciding to make a change again. So, yeah, we potentially won't see it for quite a while, maybe, if they make this. It, it may not. I think. They'll I mean, probably want to let this one lie for a while. I think they'll probably want it yeah. to lie, uh, given the fact that the, the flip flopping, yeah. flip -flop. that it's gone. But again, I mean, it's it's wildlife management in Utah, so you never know. <laughs> but it's like, I, think, I think a similar thing, though. It like, rolls like a will. We could be up, we could be having the same year. debate next yeah. year on the same day. I mean, we can. We've talked trail cameras before, but like Montana used to be run trail cameras all the time when mm -hmm. I lived up there. And they switched it to now you can only use them in the summer. And then they flip back again. Now you can use them all year again. It's so like there is times when they do flip flop, flip flop, and goes back to where it originally was. Yeah, that's just, it's largely from what people want. People want loud yeah. voices. People start talking. And then, you know, you, you talk about a state agency. I mean, that is a state agency. They work for the people of that state. And if yeah. the people of that state want a certain action, it could maybe happen. Yeah. You want to dive into this? This will be the meat and potatoes of this probably. So this is the one that I was really interested in talking about. And uh, it's being called the Utah Buck Deer Hunting Research Study on Harvest Strategies. That's long. Say that five times fast, right? That sounds like a definite state thing right there. <laughs> like state government, they, they came up with that. Yeah. So this change is is probably the most interesting and hotly debated, I would say. This is the one that kind of... It's, it's kind of all over the place. So um, it's being proposed as a research study. So under the, the geist of them trying to learn something from this, uh, if you read through the proposal and you watch the proposal on YouTube, uh, Kent Hershey is in charge of that. He's the study coordinator, I think, for the state. I'm not sure what his official title is. Sorry, Kent. Um, but basically being proposed as a study. And if you read through the proposal, you look through it and you listen to him talk, it's kind of being pitched as like, we are trying to learn how to bolster, improve populations. 
of mule deer in the state of Utah. We're we talking populations as a whole or populations of bucks or <sighs> populations 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 yeah in quotations populations because i think that's the ultimate goal you know you want to improve populations because the more deer there are on the landscape the more opportunity there is to Mm -hmm. hunt more bucks more does just just deer in general um i think they are looking at ways to increase population and what they can learn from that that's the way it's being proposed anyway um it's an interesting proposal uh I guess I'll just run through the changes. So you're looking at those being proposed from 2024 to 2027. So what is that? Three years, I guess. Three, it'd four years. Four, 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 four years. Four hunt consecutive. years. Yep. It'd four. be four hunt years. Starting in 2024, uh, permit numbers would remain constant across these units that they're proposing, and those that constant number is based off a of four year average uh, from 2020 to 2023. Uh, so you're looking at a, a set number of permits across the different hunts, right? Uh, so what you're late basically looking at, these are all units in the Southern region. So the Pine Valley unit, you are looking at a antler point restriction. So four point or better on one side, not including eye guards, yep, not including eye guard. uh, total number of permits, 3,150. That would remain constant. So four point or better antler restriction, meaning nothing could be killed if it did not have at least a four point on one side. Uh, beaver, beaver unit, you're talking shortened season, which it would be five day rifle season, five day muzzleloader season, and two week archery season, which would start on the first Saturday in September. Ooh, moving that way late. So Ooh. you're not you're no longer starting to archery August. hunt yeah. in August. You're, Ouch. You're, so they're stripped. They're they're gonna be they're gonna be stripping, stripping. yeah they're mm-hmm. gonna be, be tough hunt yeah that'll be a tough hunt with the bow they will be stripping yep and also shorten two weeks total uh, same thing for the southwest desert beaver in the southwest desert same management proposals you're talking shortened seasons uh, Mount Dutton you're talking restricted weapons so compounds see ya later <laughs> bye 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 you're talking bye Felicia yeah bye Felicia that's it. <laughs> Yeah, you're talking recurves, longbows, uh, no sights, uh, muzzleloaders. You're talking flintlock, no percu- no no primer, no 209 primers. Uh, you're you're talking old school true, true muzzleloader yeah, hunting. True primer. Yep, old school muzzleloaders, and then get the Hawkins out. Yeah, yeah, and then rifle with no scope. So open sights on a rifle. Do you okay. know many people who shoot? You know, I don't rifle? even think you can buy a rifle. I was actually thinking about this last night. You buy a rifle. They don't have sights on it. No. They don't no, anymore. no. That's gone by not the anymore. Side. Yeah. Yeah. You're going to have to probably get like an old lever action. I'm going to find my granddaddy's old gun. That's it. You need a Henry lever wow. action. Okay. Yep. Yep. And then uh, the Boulder Kaparowitz unit combined. All restrictions. So four point or better on at least one side. Two week rifle season, two week muzzleloader season. Two, no, not two week, five day. Five day. Five day. Easy. I'm going to go back and I'm going to rein that in. So Boulder Kaparowitz, all restrictions. So four point or better. Shortened season, five day rifle, five day muzzleloader, two week archery starting first Saturday in September. Primitive weapons. So no compound bows, old school muzzleloaders, rifles, no scopes. So combined, all of them. Okay. And then Monroe, Zion, they're kind of using those as a control, if you will. No restrictions, no changes in seasons. They're going to keep those on. Which two units? Was it, were the Monroe that? and the Zion. It's, it's also interesting, too, under the restricted weapons, semi-auto rifles are prohibited. Prohibited. Yeah, you can't just. <laughs> <laughs> you, yeah, AK-47. Yeah. If it's iron sights and I can't have a scope, I'm going to just launch five rounds. Yeah, in that would like be a pretty seconds. good option. Yeah, just an AK, semi-auto, open sights. You got your old, you know, Russian issue AK and you just go at it. <laughs> Russian issue. <laughs> um, Don't know where you're getting your black guns from. That's yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking more like a 308 here. Yeah. yeah. You know, this shows you how much I know. I don't know. I don't know <laughs> shit. Uh, so pretty interesting uh, proposals. Um, I've got my thoughts and my feelings. <laughs> There's a you? lot here. How do you want to flush it apart? Yeah, there's a lot How do you want to attack well, it? Well, quick thing. Why is it? Are they going to do anything on the northern regions, or is it all no. just going to be southern for this test? This is all southern region focused. What's the, you know what the reasoning is there? 
if you want my honest opinion, and this is, again, this is just my opinion. I think if you look through the reasoning behind this study, uh, public outcry. So people demanding, wanting change. Uh, looking at the herd not being particularly happy with the way they feel the herds should be managed. And I think the loudest voices mm-hmm. are in the southern region. Yeah. So I think I could see that. I think that's that's what my gut tells me is it's probably focused at the southern region because I think that's where you've had the most public input and opinion. It, is it because from. southern guys like trophy bucks more and the northern guys want to shoot whatever? I mean, if you look at the proposals, I would say even though they're being you know, flagged or talked about in a population perspective. If you look at these proposals, to me, it's pretty apparent that they are being aimed at buck to doe ratios yeah. and not necessarily population management. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> which, so, it, which in itself, there's, you know, there's a discussion to be had. Yeah. But. So it, a lot of the times in, in these podcasts where we do this, you and Brady do a lot of research and get everything. Mm-hmm. I come in cold for, for which is great in, i like the in reasoning. real That's, yeah in mm-hmm. real okay mm-hmm. so as you're reading through those this is the first time i've heard of them yep and i knew you were at these meetings but i was waiting for mm-hmm. i was waiting for this to, to get it. what this is i had a pretty strong emotional reaction mm-hmm. but then as you kept reading through them and i was going and i'm kind of racking my head of what i'm hearing and the re- reason for it all so there's one thing i can say in a positive light that change is not easy Mm-hmm. And change is often a very good thing. Mm-hmm. And a lot of the times, a a massive shift is a good way to quickly learn where you need to be and work your way back quickly afterwards. Mm-hmm. Now, four years is that's not super quick in my opinion. But that's- I do appreciate that the state is putting themselves out there to like really shake things up and they're willing to change. Mm-hmm. I, I do. It's a, a pretty pre- gnarly proposal. It's a gnarly from the proposal. State. So I, I, after I kind of toned my emotional response back and I'm like, you know what? I actually do appreciate somebody is willing to like mm-hmm. go pretty gnarly on this to figure yeah. it out because none of us are taking none crack of us are it. like truly happy with a lot of the mule yeah, deer I would agree. hunts in the West right now. Right. I'm pretty happy. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I'm not like, I mean, here's the thing is like, and this is going to come out in discussion, but like I, certainly it could be better. Yeah, it could, I mean, it, could, it, could, it could be better. But, but it, I, it, it by and large, I've been quite or satisfied be with the hunts that I've had. When I've had a deer tag, I felt like I've had a good hunt. And that's not the case. You're talking I, even I, on general hunts. Yeah. Yeah. Not yeah, talking I've about had, I've had great draws. general hunts. Yeah. yeah. I've had really good general hunts. And I think, by and large, I'm pretty happy with the way the management and the yeah. opportunity has gone. Like, I, I felt like my draw odds kind of reflected the opportunity that I got. Yeah. And then I also felt like when I have hunted, you know, Obviously, I I hunt the way I like to hunt, and I yeah. put time and effort into it. I felt like I have been a, I've been rewarded with the type of buck that I thought I was put the effort put, in. Yeah, for. yeah. Yes. I felt like I was rewarded ju- justly. I don't know. Yeah. If you I'm going to say it, but I think you're you're also a really good hunter trail. So and a lot could, of time, I, so I, don't, I wonder time, if general population effort. isn't. Yeah, and and I get that. I'm and I, I'm not saying. Yeah, I'm definitely not. I, I'm probably in. I'm not an outlier in that. I feel like I'm a good hunter. I just I'm in a unique. I have a unique perspective in the the unit that I hunt or the units that I've hunted. I know really well. I have time yeah. and effort to put into it. Mm-hmm. I'm not probably your average hunter that draws any tag of any sorts and goes out and goes yeah. on. You put your yeah. time in. Which is fine. Yeah. You put your time in the yeah. weapon. You put so your time in physical but it, gear. But, by, but the, the, the bulk of this is that people are generally not happy. Otherwise, we wouldn't be looking at this. Yeah. You, yes. That's so, the point. So this is a good place to pick it back up mm-hmm. because as soon as I got myself internally calmed down to be like, mm. you know what? I appreciate that they're changing. And then I went back to like listening to the words I was hearing and what you were saying, mm-hmm. what this sounds like to me. Cause then I'm, then as you're going through it, I'm like, yeah, but I don't, I don't know if this is going to accomplish and this. And then like, why, what would this be for? What it sounds like to me is like you said, Southern Utah mm-hmm. has some pretty loud voices. Mm-hmm. And just like Brady said, we're, traditionally, we're, we're passionate in the Southern region. Traditionally <laughs> Southern Utah, for whatever reason has, they have a culture of trophy buck hunting there like you have never seen. We like, oh, we like big like bucks. We will not lie. Like social <laughs> structure in southern Utah <laughs> revolves yeah. around how many big deer you've killed, not about like, you mm-hmm. know, being a, a 
citizen, a good citizen of society, mm. right? Yeah. It's yeah. just an interesting, it's an interesting thing there, that, that culture. What it sounds like to me is there is a lot of really good trophy hunters who have the ear of DWR right now. That's what it sounds like to me. Because it sounds like to me right here, you are, you are essentially, you are putting a non-resident, you know, guy's got 10 days to hunt, typically. Mm -hmm. Now you're cutting those 10 days down to five. Mm -hmm. he's, he doesn't live there, doesn't know the unit super well. He's drawn the tags. He just wants to go out there, go hunting, bring his brother, brother-in-law, whatever it is, go out there and have a good hunt. Mm -hmm. You're putting him massively behind the eight ball to a guy who knows what he's doing, has been yeah. there, knows those units, and wants to see some age class get back into the bucks, some buck to doe ratios so here's get an, to the right yeah, spot. And That's what it sounds like to me. This doesn't sound like a majority public, the best for the majority public. This mm -hmm. sounds like really good for some Southern Utah residents. Mm. Yeah. It, this is probably a good time to just note a couple of statistics. Uh, average days hunted. So when we had, and, and Utah's had five day seasons. So we yeah. did, we did this in like the early two thousands, early to, it might've been right. 2006, seven, somewhere in that time frame. We went to five day rifle seasons, uh, average days hunted three and a half. Mm -hmm. That's average days for people that have a nine day season. Average days hunted for a five day season was three. So people averaged a half a day longer average day, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, harvest, we killed as many bucks on a five day season as we killed on a nine day season. Yeah. So st statistically we're killing the same amount of deer. Yeah. And this, like what Renzo's kind of hitting at, you got a guy coming from this Pennsylvania, the, this New is York. The anomaly. That guy is going to hunt the full days, probably full nine days. Yeah. But also if there's no point restriction, we're talking about that guy only has five days. He's going to probably shoot something. He's like, I traveled all the way out here. I'm going to shoot yeah. something. And right. it might, might be a younger age class deer. So you're going to put more pressure on younger age class deer because they just want to put something on the ground, yeah. get meat in the well, freezer, which is but cool. Let's save the, let's save the point restriction because we all are. But yeah, no, we'll, we'll, we'll get, we'll get to that. Shorten season. I'm just talking let's, about. Let's talk, let's talk season. I'm talking, about these, I'm talking about these weapon restrictions, season dates, mm -hmm. those types of let's things. Let's do that. Let's talk, let's talk season dates first. Season yeah. dates. The, I mean making them truly primitive kind of goes on that first conversation we mm -hmm. were just talking about, about the muzzle, scoped muzzle loaders. I, to take away compound bows and to go to flintlock round ball, like that just sounds like a lot of wounding. <laughs> it, to me, that just sounds like a lot of wounding. Yeah. Um, That's just my first gut reaction. Mm -hmm. That's what it sounds like to me. And you throw the reekers and longbows. That's what I'm saying. Just a lot of wound. That's what it, that's what that sounds you're like. Gonna, you're gonna you're gonna definitely wound more deer. Yeah. Like that was my that was my gut we are reaction we already we already wound a decent number of deer yeah. with compounds. I think just personal opinion. I think it happens. Uh, I think you're you're going to take that even more so with a with yeah. a reeker. Yeah. Yeah. And then to push those into the second Saturday of September, mm -hmm. like either strip or post strip of those deer. That is going to be a That's, wildly tough hunt. That, it's going to be a tough hunt for those recurve guys. Well, not and, and and it's yet to be determined on whether when they're going to start. The, the, that's just for shortened season. So you're talking the beaver, the Southwest Desert. Those would have compound bows just yeah. to shorten season starting yeah, in September. Yeah, it's just these units you're talking so about. So the the Dutton unit where they're talking restricted oh. weapons, that one may still start in August. Okay. So it, that one may still be in August. This, there's a lot of issues here, and it's hard to actually flesh them out, like all of them. I mean, I, yeah, I've, I've thought there's of, a lot here. So when I was hit with this, when I you know heard it, and then I've gone back and I've thought through it, like it, it's taking me a long time to try to work it through because it's so much. Well, you have me in real time working yeah, through this right here. <laughs> no, it's so much to try, it, to, it's to, a lot. try to tackle. So let's, let's go back before we get on to restricted weapons. Let's go back to season dates. Okay. So sh we're, we're talking two, three units. We're talking beaver, southwest desert, and we're talking the boulder. Would have five-day rifle, five-day muzzleloader, and two-week archery seasons. Starting the second Starting Saturday second of September. In September. Mm -hmm. Okay. Statistically, we're going to kill the same number of deer. Yep. I, I think. I mean, the numbers. Statistically. If we go back and we look at harvest statistics yeah. from years when we tried that, we we haven't tried a two week archery season, so maybe you'll save some some bucks on the archery portion of that. Uh, anecdotally, I can tell you that having hunted through all those years, 
I did see more mature bucks on the back ends of those shortened seasons because I think what was happening was most people had a weekend to hunt. You had a five day hunt, you had one weekend. I think people were generally shooting the first deer, first yeah. buck that they saw. Really that was available point. to them. It's a very good point. Which is often a younger age class of buck. It's a two yep. and a half year old buck, you know, a yearling buck. Like I was saying, the guy coming from the East Coast out yep. here, he's going to shoot the yeah. first thing he sees now. Mm-hmm. It's a short season. Yeah. It's the most time. So in regard to that, uh, back when we had five day seasons, uh, for me as a hunter, I actually, me as a hunt, me personally as a hunter that scouted a lot, put a lot of time and effort into it. I actually kind of liked it because I felt like more bucks made it through those hunts and got another year of age to them. Yep. And I like hunting a big buck. I'm not, I'm not, I'm, I'm okay with saying I do it, too. right? Yep. Um, so I, that's an interesting part of this. I do not see, in my opinion, I do not think this is going to have any population level impact. No. And this, so this is probably a good time to note this. That's that's where I'm coming from. Yeah. It's like it, this doesn't sound like population to, for Dynamics. more opportunity. No. I can't, I can't honestly make the argument with any of these proposals that they are going to increase population. And I know that probably somebody listening at this point, this is not, it's not going to make sense to them. They're going to say, but you're saving more bucks. That's more population. In theory... Yeah, I mean, a buck is part of a population. If that buck goes forward into the next year, that's a part of the population. But in reality, a buck cannot have a fawn. Yeah. <laughs> they can't get pregnant. They can't have a fawn. It is 2023. So. <laughs> they might. Be I don't able. know if you know. I don't know if you know this. <laughs> it would be sick if they could. To be <laughs> I'd be all in favor for yeah. that. If a buck could have a fawn, that'd be awesome. If we could get fawns from bucks and does. Gosh, we'd have amazing. These, these new scientists seem to think in 2023 that. <laughs> that would I be mean, that'd be fantastic. I'd be yeah. all in favor for that. But a buck can't have a doe, or, or a buck can't produce a fawn, right? So really, your population driver. The way that you increase deer populations, elk populations, is that you have a healthy fawn crop, crop. F- produced from does. A lot of yep. does on the landscape. And just with, with the system, which is a, a polygamous system for deer and elk ungulates, statistically, if you have in the neighborhood of 11 bucks per 100 does, 90% plus of every doe in that population gets bred. So anything above and beyond 11 to maybe that 15 window per 100 does is surplus. They can be taken off the landscape, almost no impact whatsoever. And actually, if you think about it, a buck consumes feed and he occupies space. Yep. Okay. Removing that buck from feed and space, in theory, opens up that landscape, landscape to a fawn that would be you know produced the next year. If that fawn is a doe, she can produce another fawn and you grow deer. Now, some people are going to say that really only matters if you're like pushing carrying capacity. Okay. Sure. I can understand that argument, but a buck is still eating feed mm-hmm. on a landscape. He's still occupying space on a landscape that could in theory be occupied by a fawn, a doe that can yeah. then produce more deer. Yep. So I don't think, as I look through these, and I'm just I'm going to say it outright, I don't think that any of these objective, any of these studies, management strategies, proposals, I do not think they are going to have popula- population well, level impacts. Well, then you said the data su- in the data from the past them. supported that. So what it sounds like is age class and trophy hunting getting better for. People who are that's what it sounds really like know to the me. units and really that's what know it what sounds like to me, which in, it, in itself is okay if that's what if that's what the public wants, I guess. But it it comes at a cost. That's yeah. the yeah. that's the thing is it definitely comes at a cost. It comes at a cost of me not being able to hunt with my compound bow and my muzzleloader. Mm-hmm. Okay, which is going to in turn make me more ineffective. Right? People that hunt the Pine Valley, you can only shoot a four point or better on one side. How many individuals out there are going to end up taking, you know, a kid, a kid draws a permit, turtle draws a permit on the Pine Valley. You yeah. take him out, he's 12, right? How many bucks are you going to look over? First of all, you're speaking to like my <coughs> heaven on earth day. I can't wait to take him hunting okay. on his own deck. Okay. So let yeah. you, you, that's your unit you live closest yeah, to. I do. Yep. Right. So that is the closest unit to you. 
turtle turns 12. This is all hypothetical. Turns 12. Hopefully not in sure. eight years. You, you, yeah. <laughs> you, you, he draws a permit. You take him out on the landscape. Uh, and this is going to happen next year if it passes. You know, you take a kid, you take a new hunter. My brother just killed a buck this last week. He killed a three point. Hadn't yeah. killed a deer in 14 years over the moon. Over he the was freaking static. Moon. Yeah. Ecstatic. Phenomenal day. Phenomenal yeah. hunt. Had a blast, right? You take those individuals out there. Sure, they have a permit in their pocket, but they cannot harvest a buck unless it has four points on one side or better. Yeah. So they're going to look, how many bucks are you going to look over before you get a crack at a four point? You're probably not going to kill one, to be honest. Yep. Mm -hmm. You figure Pine Valley, 3,100, 3,200 permits, right? Yeah. Um, harvest, you kind of extrapolated out what harvest is. They're, they're probably, you're probably only looking at maybe 200 to 300 four points that are potentially yeah. available to be taken off that unit. Yeah. Do you want to get into point, the point restriction? Because this <clears throat> yeah, one I am can, very passionate about. Yeah, we can get into it. I, I just, I don't think, I guess I wanted to establish five-day seasons, shortened seasons, and then we can yeah. put that one to bed. That Look, that's not going to bother me. Me either. That's not going to bother me. Me either. But when I look at the landscape of hunting and hunters right the population of mm -hmm. hunters like i do think that will have an effect on people out there that don't necessarily des deserve the shit into the stick on this one that are non-resident traveling from a long way away mm -hmm. um maybe multiple tags in in the family whatever it is like five days is it's pretty quick it's not gonna it, the, i would be fine with five days because my hunting style honestly does line up pretty well with a five yep. day season. I would spend five days before scouting and I would hunt five days, probably hopefully be killed within the first couple of days. Right. Yep. Like that's typically Bucks how my, killed scouting. That's how my hunts have gone in the past. Um, yeah. you know, very rarely am I going to the last day because of the time. And again, just like you said, I, I'm very lucky and blessed to be able to have time and energy and mm. resource to go out there and yep. scout and do all this stuff. But not everybody does. And I think those five-day seasons really put people behind the eight ball that don't necessarily deserve it. Well, here's the thing that it does show is that statistically it's not going to make that much of a difference. Yeah, They're still going to kill bucks. Likelihood yeah. of them killing a yeah. mature buck, go down because yeah. you got less days to do so, it. So my genu genuine stance there is I'm good with it either way. Sure. Like if people do feel like it's going to impede their hunt style coming from a long way, they need to say it. Sure. It's not going to affect me, so I'm I'm good with it. Yeah, now I, the point I restriction, I am very passionate about, and I am very against point restriction. Why? Very against it. <laughs> Why? Because not every mule deer you is going to be a four point. And I, okay, good point. Not every buck is going to be a four point. Not, and you mean with, ever? Ever. Like he may never hit a four point. Never hit a yep. four point. Yep. There are genetic, these genetics ingrained in these animals and they will not hit four points. Now that's probably, that's probably like a very small faction of the mule deer population out there, especially in Pine Valley. There is generally good genetics, but then there's also regressed bucks mm -hmm. that turn into three points and sometimes two by threes and very old regressed, not even breeding bucks anymore past mm -hmm. their breeding age and it now you you're not you can't even kill those bucks which those are the ones that need to be killed now mm -hmm. the hard part of this is it's a big ask and uh it's a big ask you're going to be wildly unpopular by the way for saying this I, oh i know <laughs> it, i was really blown away by this when i read through the comments and i've, and, I've read through hundreds in of theory it's a great thing in theory it is really good yeah it's really good and in, in theory right when you think about it in theory it's really really good yeah but i can't i've again been very blessed and lucky to hunt a lot i've i have a lot of days in the field throughout my you know my hunting life the amount of animals that you see that are mature that don't hit point requirements it's it's pretty pretty staggering honestly like there's a lot of bucks out there that don't like you would say more than you would think way yeah. more than you would think i would say way more than you would think can i jump to a quick example well, i just want to make this one point it is hard though this is where it's interesting it is hard for the ask to the general population to be able to age a deer on the hoof Oh, impossible. It's really tough. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Unless you do it all the time. Mm -hmm. I would say, you know, a very small population of hunters, I would say us three are very capable of aging a deer at four year old plus, five year old plus on the hoof, right? Mm -hmm. That's a tough ask for just a general population of hunters. 
So how do you, you should be managing for age, not point structure, which is what they do for elk, which yeah. is, yeah. yeah, you should be, you should be managing for, for maturity, not mm. point mm -hmm. because there's a lot of two year old bucks that will be four points. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Two and a half year old deer hit four points. Those are the best genetics on planet sure. earth. And you will have two whacked. and a half, you will have two and a half year old bucks mm -hmm. that have double branched, both sides splits. Four point bucks. Yep. And they're going to get whacked. Why is it so Those popular? Those are not the one you were. So why, why do you think that? You should that, be killing why, the regressed three point. Why are antler restrictions so popular so, among the public? I, 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 uh, because because it's, it's, an easy, it's an easy visual. It's an easy <laughs> reference. And in theory, you would think yeah. and a buck only gets bigger as they get older. You yeah. would think yeah. in theory, right? That's this but is my, what, my cousin. Those, my cousin killed an eight and a half year old three point. This is one of those things. It's yeah, that's crazy. And it's it. giant, by the way. But it's an eight and a half year old three point. This is one of those things that it seems, in theory, like you just you think about it. Your common sense, okay? You go to a point restriction. This is a great thing. We're gonna save some bucks. Yeah. yeah. We're gonna grow bigger bucks. There's gonna be more bigger bucks on the landscape. But none of the data, none of the none of the studies that have been done, no state except for one. I did find one. Um, n none of it supports antler restrictions as being a good, viable yeah. option for the population. Yeah. yeah. And I think it goes back to what I was saying earlier is just, it sounds correct. Like we're talking about right now, yeah. four point restrictions sounds correct for almost 95% of the hunters. It seems like, Oh, great idea. But again, those people might not have done the research to read these studies that have already been done. Like I have a piece of paper right here. I have a, we talked last night. I have a bunch of four point restriction like studies. PDF saved in my computer and I pulled one up and I have a ton mm -hmm. of highlights on it that I've been doing in prep for this. None of them work. Like I said, I think there was a Washington study that did show that slight impacts, but a lot of them have quick impacts like that first year, mm -hmm. but then long-term it goes back down again. Mm -hmm. Like they don't work. They put more pressure on two to three-year-old deer yes. and then those genetically inferior deer, like I wanted yeah. to break, bring up that example. Didn't you, this, this is Mexico, so it's obviously not yep. Utah. But didn't you shoot a giant forkosaurus, or was that a fork by three? Absolutely giant. That I would shoot that deer. Eight-year-old deer. All the time. In Mexico, which is like a 10-year-old deer here. So that is a deer. Yeah. That is and a, a, a cranker deer that will never be touched. And yes, it is Mexico. But I'll, I'll give you two, I'll give you two very real, very recent real world Western examples. Colorado, right? Where Clay Hill mm. guides. I go out there, help him go out there hunting, stay at his place all the time. He had a three-point on his um, his lease property. This would have been last year. Uh, yeah, last year. By far the biggest and most mature buck on the landscape. By far. And he was running with a pile of younger four-point good bucks. Mm -hmm. But everyone wanted to kill the three-point because it's cool to kill older deer. That's sure. what everyone yeah. wanted to kill. Yep. You're going to put that buck off limits to mm -hmm. go to go out there and shoot. And all of his hunters that he had in camp, they were trying to kill this big three-point. It's yeah. a, and a big two-point that he had on there. And there, there are genetics out there that just... They have three point genetics or two by three genetics mm -hmm. or whatever it is. I saw on the Penguin unit this year, I saw a very mature, very old two by three. Mm -hmm. To think that you can't go kill that buck, he was definitely the buck to kill, like no question about it. Yep. And then when I was in BC, here's a very good example. When I was in BC on my stone hunt, and I was glassing these elk down on the bottom because stone sheep are too hard to glass, <laughs> <laughs> at least midday when they're bedded in the shell. So, they uh, they have a six point restriction on their bull elk up mm -hmm. there. Six point restriction. They have a genetic where they're missing twos. Like they have a missing two <laughs> genetic. They're just, like, just, hey, listen up, guys. You I, don't, I don't throw know. a two on one it's, side. It's You're going. Really, <laughs> it's really interesting because when I, there were elk hunters in camp when I was there. Yeah. Um, and they have a missing two genetic, but they have a six point restriction. I glassed up what I thought was a six point down on the bottom. I'm like, damn, that's a good bull for up here. Mm -hmm. Like, cause it's those smaller genetic, right? But big whale tails, good looking bull, had cows, very mature, like definitely old, you know, six, seven, eight year old kind of a bull, definitely mature, had definitely been, been breeding the last couple of years. Just big, big bull. He glasses them up at the spotting scale and goes, yeah, actually I can't call those other hunters. They can't kill that bull. Hmm. I'm like what do you, cause they're all on in reaches and sure. shit up there, you know? And, uh, so that's why we were glassing bulls as there was elk hunters in camp and we would always in reach because we were glassing from the top where the sheep were. We're like, hey, you know, there's elk here, elk, whatever. He didn't call that one in because it was a missing a two on the right side. So it was a six by five. Couldn't kill it. Yeah. Old bull. And it was an old 
great bull. Gotcha. Like anyone would have been wildly happy to kill that bull. Yep. And that's a real point restriction, real reality this year. Yeah. Can I, can I run through some stuff real quick? Yeah, I was going to. I'll, I'll hit on any that you don't, but yeah, run okay. through them. I want to run through this paper I have in my hand. Okay, mm-hmm. I want to put this to bed. I want people listening to this and maybe download this PDF. Check it out. <laughs> yeah. Okay, this is a big summary. Mm-hmm. It's called A Critical Review of Mule Deer Antler Point Restrictions Application and Effectiveness. It's put together by a bunch of Wyoming fishing game people. Mm-hmm. It's a big summary. So I really like this paper because yep. it summarizes a lot of different states. All right. There's one point right here. Antler point restrictions are a popular management scheme. 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 Yep. I like that the is language. often advocated by sportsmen. Okay. Mm-hmm. The intended outcome is to exclude a segment of the male population from harvest in order to increase the proportion of males in the population and or recruit additional mature males for harvest. Sounds Sounds awesome. Sounds great. Mm-hmm. That's why most people, I think, are four-point restriction, love it. They think they're on board right away. All right, let's get into some stuff here. So all antler point restriction strategies resulted in a short-term gain of the proportion of males in the population. However, male-female ratios eventually returned to pre-antler point restriction levels after varying lengths of time, regardless of whether the antler point restriction was continued. All right? So in my personal opinion, and this was a little hammer on it, Point restrictions flat out don't work. Mm -hmm. Okay. They promote genetically inferior deer, those big three points we're talking about, big two points. That's what they put into. Heavy pressure, like we talked about before, on two to three year old deer. You're going to get that first four point buck, he's going to get shot. Mm -hmm. He has the potential to be an old giant. giant. He's going to get shot. Okay. So here's varying studies by states. Okay. These are all various years they've gone to this stuff. And we have, I'll start up in Colorado here first. So Colorado implemented antler point restrictions for mule deer on a statewide basis for six years. Okay. And here's this part I want to talk about. A marked increase in illegal or accidental harvest of yearling bucks was documented. Mm -hmm. People were shooting deer they thought were four points and they weren't. So you had more younger deer still get shot. You're going to have people, you definitely have people ground truthing deer. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Okay. However, the number and proportion of mature bucks did not increase because of the four point restriction. All right, let's jump into Idaho. Overall, the long-term antler point restriction did not improve post-season buck doe ratios. Okay, after several consecutive years of increased pressure on yearling males, adult, adult buck ratios returned to pre-treatment or worse mm-hmm. levels. Okay, that's in Idaho. All right, and uh, Idaho also implemented a four-point or better season in Unit 73 in the early 2000s to reduce hunter participation in crowding. All right, the regulation was strongly backed by the public Mm -hmm. and resulted um however after several years the public became concerned about increasing number of large adult males with three-point antlers yeah okay utah we're talking about utah (laughs) utah has tried this yes for several times utah division of wildlife abandoned mule deer antler point restrictions after five years due to significant greater than 30 percent of total harvest illegal harvest of yearling males a reduced total harvest reduced hunter participation and shifting hunter distribution to areas without antler point restrictions. That's a big one. Mm -hmm. So you're going to notice these antler point restrictions. You might have people start going up North and start hunting. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a reduction of harvestable mature bucks because of the antler point restriction, Montana. All right. Efforts to increase the number of proportion of mature bucks through greater than four point seasons ended up reducing total harvest Total buck harvest by 28%, while illegal harvest of bucks with less than three points increased by nearly 40%. Mm -hmm. Doing the opposite of what they intended. Yep. All right. Oregon. They used the same thing on Steen's unit. Um, They abandoned this regulation with the number of older older bucks and overall buck doe ratio decreased after 12 consecutive years of antler point restrictions. Again, significant illegal harvest of less than three points was documented. And the postseason proportion of bucks greater than four points declined by 30%. Mm-hmm. All right. A- the antler point restrictions did not achieve the public's desire, even though the public pushes for it all the time. Wyoming. <laughs> Wyoming has done a ton of these ones. Yeah. Like a, a boatload. Yep. All right. <laughs> a boatload. They have. Uh, it was a big 12 year study here. Um, again, right after, the, right after they implement it, it does work a little bit. However, the regulation was eventually removed because the overall buck doe ratios declined and the prevalence, here you go again, of, of older points. age class three-point deer increased after the regulation was in place for several years. And again, misidentification and illegal harvest of less than three-point males was also an issue. All right? 
protection of yearling males shifted all hunting pressure to bucks that are two years old. Mm-hmm. So you're whacking all these younger deer again because they reached four-point level. And the proportion of mature bucks declined again during antler point restrictions. Now here's one. I have a lot of things in here, but one more big thing I want to talk about. Um, over the long term in Wyoming, persistently targeting large bucks because of the four-point thing is also going to eliminate desirable genetics. You're going to start eliminating some of those big buck genetics because of the four-point restrictions. Correct. So th- those, the ability for some of these males to grow large antlers is going to start decreasing. Mm-hmm. And so, permanent four-point seasons do not produce more large bucks and actually reduce harvestable surplus because some of the younger bucks that could have been harvested will die from other causes before they grow four-point antlers. Yeah. And then one great little quote, and I'll stop. <laughs> All right. This, is, this one's great. I love it because you're saying everything that I was going to get into next. Yeah, this is from uh, Carpenter and Gill in 1987, okay? Antler point restrictions have been referred to as a prescription for ailing deer and elk management without a clear understanding of the disease. Hmm. It's a great quote. Yeah, it is a great quote. People don't understand what's going on and they assume that it sounds correct that we're going to harvest more, more bigger deer because of a four point restriction. But everything I've talked about here, the hunting public is always supportive of this four point restriction, but they don't really realize it's been done before and it appears well, to work, but it doesn't work. It's just in th- like like I was saying. In theory, it is a very simple thing in your mind to think a buck only gets bigger, and every mule deer is a four point. Well, it's a, yeah. In, in the same in the same vein, that it's easy to think that if you kill less bucks, your population is just going to explode yeah. and get bigger. And that's not the case. Uh, it's yeah. about does and it's about bonds. does and fawns. Mm-hmm. So th- this point restriction thing. So you know, you're saying like, oh, those elk in BC, like, hey, let's just not grow a two. Sure. No, they killed the six points <laughs> yeah. over years and yeah. years and years. And T- now they have a bunch of five point yeah. bulls. No, I was t- tongue in cheek. Yeah, but yeah. right. Like <laughs> yeah. that's what happens in Colorado where clay is. They have a three point prevalence it's yeah. because Colorado did the four pointer better for a long time. Yep. Not every mule deer is going to be four points. Yep. yep. And it's just, it's genetic, right? Not every yeah. human male is going to be six feet tall. Yep. It's like, there's so much variance in genetic out there. And just because, you know, the iconic mule deer, like the iconic mule deer uh, definition is four mm. points, right? Yeah. Double, bra- uh, double branched split mm. four points. They don't all have that. Yeah. Not all and if you kill the two-year-old and three-year-old four points, those are the best, most desirable genetics out there. Those are all going to get killed. All the three point, two, three-year-old three points are going to make it. Those are the ones going to be breeding. Then you're going to have a mountain full of three-point deer. Yeah. Okay. I got one more thing. Sorry. You're good. I got a couple too, but I'll tack them on the end of yours. Okay, so we were talking about populations before mm-hmm. and how this is hopefully going to increase populations of a mule deer as a whole. All right. So all those studies I just, just mentioned off, Colorado, Idaho, Utah, Montana, Wyoming, total population increase from antler point restrictions, question mark. Colorado, no. Idaho, no. Um, Utah, no. Montana, no. Wyoming, no. Mm-hmm. Do not help increase total yeah. mule deer population by yep. doing an antler point restriction. <laughs> And I should say, I mean, I hope if they do try this, I hope that it is just tried for the four years and then it's put to bed. Because the four, I, four years, though, is a really good way to put a lot of three points on the mountain. Yeah, you're right. It, it, it does it does have the four potential years for is sure. plenty yeah. to put a bunch of three points on the mountain. Yeah. I mean, if you look through this study, I'm probably looking at the same or similar one to you. I mean, it does say antler restrictions does have the potential to increase your buck to doe ratio, although results vary, and mm-hmm. they're usually very temporary. So yeah. you're talking a very short time frame, and you're really talking that one to three year time period. Yeah, right away. I think if you were to continue this, you definitely have the potential to really screw it up. Yeah, in, in my in, opinion. And the interesting point too is 100 numbers during all the studies, they're all they're all decreasing because of a four point restriction. You're having less hunters wanting to go out there and hunt, which is that youth recruitment yeah. thing again. Yeah, another part of this it says uh, you definitely limit um, hunter participation, harvest success. You're definitely going to have less people out on landscape. I would also, it's interesting to me, like if you're going to issue the same number of permits and you're saying, we're going to use this four point restriction as a means to still put people in the field, give them a chance to go hunting. It's, it doesn't, it's not going to equate to a good experience for most people. Yeah. Cause you're yeah. going to, you're going to look at deer that you can't kill, you know, an old in the, gnarly, in, yeah, in, big three point. Yeah. In the long term, it may be, you might find that more frustrating, you know? Absolutely. So that's an interesting part of this too. Uh, 
I thought this was an interesting. So managers have found this is again with you know in stu- based on studies, managers have found the most effective way to recover if you're looking at a population that has a low buck to doe ratio, and you know quote unquote I'll put it in quotations population. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the most effective way is through dramatic reductions or reduction in harvest pressure on males two and younger, uh, through conservative limiting quota season or shortened season lengths. So yep, I can kind of get behind that. I read. And uh, available data also supports this. So it's it's you're, you're talking permit numbers overall, and you're talking shortened season dates potentially. If short, but not, if the not data, point restrictions. If the data supports shortened season dates for mm-hmm. better population, then I'm definitely in. Yeah, but like I, even though I know it's going to impede some people who don't but, have the benefit to come out. But what out I early. am saying is, is, it's not point restrictions. Point restrictions don't work. They no, just, they, they, don't. they don't. It's it's a sheer way they, to get inferior genetics as mm-hmm. the prevalence of whatever unit you're in. Yep. Yeah. So I, uh, can we put that one to bed? Do we feel like we've beat that one? What? How do you, I mean? Anything else about point restrictions? As I don't. As, I, I can't support as, it. As long as the public agrees to send in their uh, feedback, their feedback that yeah. it doesn't work. But I, but again, <laughs> I think I hope people you know maybe jump in. You can easily search this on Google Scholar. You can search this on regular Google. Find these reports, read them. I suggest everyone fully read them. Yeah, like they are. There's a wealth of information there, so you can then not jump on this bandwagon that every time a four point restriction gets talked about, you're going to jump on board because you don't have the the in you haven't theory, read these studies. In theory, is a great thought. Yeah, but that's just not how it works. Mm-hmm. Not every buck is four point. Yeah, and you can probably put this as a concluder on this. So it says while data suggests that antler point restrictions definitely increase total buck ratios, at least temporarily. So you're talking one to three years potentially. They do not appear to increase the number or ratio of adult bucks in the population. In fact, it's quite the contrary over a longer period of time. Yes. Yep. So take home for me, I don't think point restrictions are going to increase your population. They're definitely not proven to do so. They don't make more large bucks. They don't make more big bucks, larger bucks in the grand scheme of things. Uh, It will temporarily increase your buck to doe ratio in that population. And I should say this across all of these different proposals. If If Utah does this, if this is the direction that they take this, my feeling, my hope is that it is under the idea that we're, we're going to learn from it and we're going to adapt and we're going to go back to a more normal, <laughs> traditional yeah. means of management on the backside. What I do fear uh, overall is that if these management strategies, if they start to produce some exciting results, because hmm. all People of a sudden, are, you know, up in arms. Oh, yeah. first, first all of a year, sudden, yeah. hey, this is working, you guys. This is totally working. And then you get to year four, and you're like, what the hell happened? Either that or yeah. outcry, like, hey, let's keep this going. Or, hey, that Dutton unit where we've restricted weapons on that unit, there's some 220 and 230 inch bucks running around. You know what that ought to be? Ought to be a limited entry unit. Hmm. Oh, yeah. And then, lo- and then, and you then lose we lose that. Yeah. You lose that opportunity. That's my fear. My fear is that maybe potentially over the short term from some of these management proposals, you start to see some things that are pretty exciting. To to, some people. To some people. Yeah. And then you you, you get the end of that. And then how do you recover from it? What do you do on the backside of this? Like, how do you, how do you transition into something else? Or do you take these and say, man, the boulder, my hell, there are so many big bucks on the boulder after this study. How can we possibly take that back to a general season unit? Yep. Like that's a fear that I have. That's a really good absolutely. Point. It's an it's yeah, so an you're outright lose fear. opportunity. Yeah, out, outright. The other the other thing I wanted to verbalize uh, that I I could see as a potential issue, and again, I'm just spitballing, I'm throwing things off a wall. How on God's green earth do you approach this from a law enforcement perspective? Mm-hmm. You have all these different units that are managed under different management. You have. Many of these units, we'll take the two, the Boulder, the Dutton, and you take those to primitive weapon for general season deer. Are you going to retain general season elk hunting on those units? And can I hunt general season spike elk with my compound bow on that same unit? So if that's the case and I have a general season deer archery tag and I have a general season archery elk spike tag, does an officer approach me and I say, oh, I'm hunting elk with my compound officer. Here's my spike elk yeah, here's tag. My, yeah. yeah. I mean, that to me is a can of worms. 
I don't know if I want to. From a law enforcement perspective, to me, this is a nightmare <laughs> on a lot of levels. A lot of pressure. pressure. So horrible. On a lot of levels. Yeah, this is a lot of pressure out there for the people who are supposed to enforce it. And then our guys just picking up the spike tag then to say they can use the compound for the spike, but then they're shooting yeah. the bucks with their compound, which should be recurve. I mean, if it's shot with an arrow and you get that thing back to your truck, who's to say if it was shot with a recurve or a compound? Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I'm just spitballing, throwing yep. ideas. But it, it, to me, it's a potential hole. It's an issue. Uh, you talk shortened season dates on some units and regular seasons on other units. I mean, that is potentially pretty tough on law enforcement. You're definitely going to have guys that are ground truthing bucks on the Pine Valley. They're going to shoot a three point and they're going to go over there and look at it and go, oops. Yeah. And yeah, they're going to walk away Yeah, That's and walk sad. away and leave it. That'll definitely happen. I think, although, you know, maybe not a grand scale, I hope not, but it's definitely a potential a possibility. Could, possibility. Could, yeah. could also too this. Uh, so if we have a couple of years of really tough, you know, recurve, or I guess I'm not going to talk about the recurve side, but just shortened seasons. Mm-hmm. So archery hunt September 1st is, you know, the first two weeks there. Or if that archery hunt's so tough, those bucks are going to surviving through archery and then going into the muzzy hunt. Now the muzzy hunt becomes phenomenal. Yeah. Even though even, there's a lot of, a lot of hypotheticals. And, and now more people are jumping in the muzzy game because yeah. all the bucks are surviving the archery and yeah. they get more competition there, harder tags to get, yep. their odds go up. Yeah. And then when you talk about weapons restrictions, um, you know, on the Dutton, I, I hate it, just one, because I want to hunt with my compound. I love hunting with my compound. I, I This is just a personal gripe. I hate the idea. I want to be able to go out and hunt with my compound. I feel like, I mean, an archery, archery mule deer, I think, is one of the most challenging hunts in, yeah. in the West as it is. It is. Uh, I'm not in favor of that. A lot of that's personal. Um, you know, I I will say I, I really feel, I honestly really feel for people that – have a tradition of hunting either the boulder or, or the Dutton potentially. Um, if you have a tradition, a family, if you live in tropic or boulder or one of those small towns, Bicknell, you know, boulders your mountain, you hunt the boulder. I mean, you're essentially for the next four years, shortened seasons, four pointer better, no modern technology whatsoever on your weapons, all, all of it. So then you're, now you're going out and spending more money. To get some of these other weapons too. I just might want to, your yeah. your opportunity is really getting kicked in the shorts. Yeah, you have less days to hunt. You can only kill four point buck, and you can only do it with your recurve or your flintlock muzzleloader. It's pretty yeah. tough. It's a pretty wide swing on that, and I really feel for people. You know, I feel for my. I love to hunt the Dutton. You know, no bones about it. That's my unit. I love to hunt it. Uh, I know it really well. It really bums me out that I won't you know, potentially be able to hunt with my compound bow on that unit. So it'd be, it'd be really hard for me to be in favor of it. And it's just on a personal level. Um, and again, I don't know that I think those units, I don't, it's not going to really do anything in my opinion. I think all the studies suggest it. You're not, you're not impacting population. You're impacting buck to doe ratios potentially on that unit. So yeah. what, what potential is going to happen to these people who are already enrolled a dedicated hunter and they thought they were going to be able to use their compound. Yeah. And then now they have to use that. Can they, I think I'd be able to get out. Like, what if I, yep, am not capable of shooting with a recurve, and I, mm-hmm. yeah, that's my season as archery, and now you're restricting me. I don't want, I don't want to be in there anymore. Yeah. So the the uh, the guidance from the division is, if it passed and you were enrolled in the dedicated hunter program in one of those two units or any of the units, if you decided you could withdraw from the program, and you could receive a prorated number of preference points back, depending on how many years you've already hunted in the program. Mm-hmm. So. To me, I'm enrolled in the Dead Cat Hunter program on a unit that would have restrictions. I would have the decision, do I withdraw from it? Because now I can't hunt the way that I want to and get some of my preference points back and, you know, bank those and, you know, try to go to a different unit and then maybe draw back into the program at a later date. So I have a decision to make. Um, but it is an option. That's, that's what's on the table is being proposed. Mm. That's tough. Make, it's, it's real tough. Well, just, making someone really decide. It's tough. And then, when you had, yeah. you thought you had something for mm-hmm. three years, and now you get swept out from a rug from you. The other side of this too, why we're passionate about people being involved and letting their voice be heard too, is it, it's a copycat game. Mm-hmm. State government. It's a copycat game, and if one goes, then more are willing, and you know what I mean. Yeah. So it's like just Utah's talking about it now, but if it does take off, and there is. I don't know, public, not enough public outcry, then another state might want to try it. And then another state and then another state. Yeah. So here, let me, let me go back. Let's, we'll maybe flip the conversation. So I feel like 
we've kind of we've combed through what's being proposed. I don't. I think we all kind of agree. We don't think that the it's going to work as far as terms of population, population goes. We're definitely no. not. Doesn't sound like we're in favor of antler point restrictions over long term. Trying to grow a trophy box sounds like sounds like a great management plan. <laughs> so let's let's flip well, it. Well, other than the point restriction. Yeah. But. So let's let's flip it on its ear and let's say like if you are the division of wildlife resources. And you are being asked by the public, we want to hunt more mature deer. We want to see more bucks on the landscape. We also want to have the opportunity to draw a permit. I mean, what do you do if you're in their shoes? What do you do? You make it very clear. There's only one way to do that. Which? Permit restrictions. Per- permit cutting, numbers. Cutting permits. Yeah. So that gets into the bait. Um, it's just a, rea- it's a reality of life. Look, everyone... Everyone wants to work less and make more money. Who doesn't want that? I mean, I do. Who doesn't want that in life? I mean, <laughs> no. it's quarter. You hear that? Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, it's a very simple. It's it's right. Yeah. Everybody wants. Mm-hmm. Everybody wants everything to be cheaper and make more money and work less. Everyone wants that. Who doesn't? Mm-hmm. But the reality is that's the only way to make more money is to work more, work harder. Right? Like mm-hmm. it's really simple. So in in this. And every, that's a kind of like a known thing. So in this world, I, I don't know, I don't want to say everyone's uneducated because I don't think they are, but I don't, it seems pretty simple of like, hey, you want more population? There's only one way to do this. It's cut permits. You, you can cut permits, which will, which will, will help your take of your bucks. Um, the, the only way to increase population and people are going to hate this is just beg and plead with mother nature to be kind. Oh, that too. And, of and, course. and habitat. I mean, she, she rules all. I mean, she's, she is the dictator when it comes to population I was, growth. I was getting into more of the parts yeah. that we can control sure, sure. now, but I do want to say I'm, I'm not for that, by the way, mm-hmm. I'm not for that cutting permit. Yeah. I'm not for that. I'm just saying like, that is the way to do it. My point, my, uh-huh. my point being of like, Work less, but make more money. Uh-huh. Everybody wants more opportunity, have more tags, but they want more mature bucks on the mountain. Yeah, it's like they want it all. it's the same. It's the same concept. I want to work less and make more. Yes. Yeah. So, do you think we could put more effort in not doing this into more habitat work, more predator management? Predator obviously, management is another great way to do it, in my opinion. We we obviously can't, like you said, control Mother Nature. We can't. Mm-hmm. We can't tell when there's gonna be a winter kill, when there's gonna be a drought. But what we can do is make sure there's the best habitat, best feed. After the yeah. winter, we can only the summer and yeah. then control control predators. We can only control the parts that we can control. Mother nature, you're entirely right. It's all it's majority mm. up to that, but we can't control that. Yeah. But habitat takes money. Habitat, habitat takes a lot of money. Habitat takes a lot of money. And and Utah has been very proactive with habitat management, more more so than any other western yes. state. And here's another here's here's probably a good point to make this. So if you go back to just 2016, 2017. Everything in Utah was right. Right as the rain. I mean, deer hunting was good by most people's accounts. The quality was was there. People had permits. We were issuing more permits. Everything was awesome, right? Uh, What did we also have during that same time frame? So we had uh, scopes with muzzleloaders. We had trail cameras. We had baiting. We had long seasons. We had compound bows on bow archery hunts. We started bow hunts in August. Mm-hmm. So if we had all those things and we had good deer numbers and we had good quality, uh, what is the X factor? It's mother nature. It is mother nature. She's, she's mother nature. Yeah. I mean, she does what she will do, right? So right now, yeah, we're in a tough patch. We've lost some deer to due to drought. We had probably three years of consecutive drought that was really heavy. I mean, like record-breaking. We've had some winters in northern Utah, uh, probably less so in the southern region, um, and we lost a lot of deer. So what what is our management? What can we do? So Brady makes a great point. You can do habitat, which I agree with. We, we should Entirely continue, agree and with. I think Utah is committed to do that. I think they're committed to keep at habitat, and I think in talking to habitat managers and biologists, they are looking at moving up the mountain. I think summer range is becoming increasingly more important, right? So we're looking at summer range and winter range, not just winter range. So you keep doing habitat. You guys bring up predators. Uh, Utah probably has the most aggressive stance on predator, predator management control. in, oh, yeah. in of all the Western states. I agree. The only way probably to do even more predator management than a state than, than Utah is doing is if you want to bring back like 1080. So if you want to start poisoning coyotes and lions yeah. again, you're going to have an impact on mule deer. Yeah. And I'm not pulling I'm not saying you want it or don't want it. I'm just saying it was. It worked. 
yeah. effective as all get out. Yeah, it worked. <laughs> and what's really hard for the general hunter right now to go out and do is predator hunt because everyone keeps saying, well, you should do more predator hunting. Everyone should go out and shoot sure. some coyotes. But that takes a lot of money. Mm-hmm. It, like, look at gas prices. Look at everyone, you know. Look at ammo prices. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like it's hard for someone to go out and do that without, you know, government yep. killing of it or arrow gunning and all this other stuff like the crazy yep. poisoning and all that stuff. But it's like getting a lot more predators, mm-hmm. getting a lot more coyotes, we're going to have more fawns. So really the thing that you can do is you can adjust permit numbers. And, yeah. you know, I think doe, I don't think we should be harvesting does. I no. think anything that we can possibly do to not harvest does should be done. I mean, if there's a landowner program and you got a bunch of deer in somebody's fields and they're eating, eating them out of house and home, I think uh, depredation, you know, killing those does should be very last resort. If there's anything that we can possibly do, which I think the division does, I think they try, but if there's, you know, sportsman group, if there's any other way that we can get involved as the public to try to compensate landowners for supporting does on their alfalfa and on their fields, I think we should do that. And then permit numbers. And I think this is one of those things. It's like, I think reduction in permit numbers it's just the nature of the beast sometimes. It's just going to have to happen. If You you can't have it all. You can't, can't draw a permit every two years, every year. And expect and, only mature animals. And expect only nice bucks and a lot of them on the landscape. Yeah. You just can't. So you have to be okay with reductions ebbs and, and, sometimes, and ebbs and flows. Yeah. And in my opinion, I would rather, if the, if the public wants you know, more bucks on the landscape, In my opinion, take home, I would rather see just a reduction in permits overall for a few years, you know, hope that Mother Nature gives us what we need. And I I can't hunt as much. Devil's advocate. Where's the state going to get that money? Are they going to want to do that? Because now that now the state's not getting the money. You're going to have to increase, put you know, permit costs potentially. And this is this is probably another little uh, soapbox that I should jump on. One of the most common comments that I see. If I read any forum, any reply to anything that we do via social media, one of the first things that I see people say is like, DWR in Utah, you're all about the money. You're all about the money. State's getting rich, Mm -hmm. you know? Show me. (laughs) Show me where any state agency, and and this, this is just, I've worked for the state of Utah and I am admittedly i'm a little bit biased like i i I sympathize with those individuals because what they're trying to do is a really hard job it's really hard to manage everybody's wants and needs all the draw odds all the big bucks that people want to see private landowners to public land hunters depredation depredation, i mean my gosh their job is so complicated uh so I am a little biased. I am sympathetic to, you know, division employees and state employees, but I will say, show me, show me a division employee that's getting wealthy. <laughs> yeah. Show me, show me the division employee, because here's the hard, hard and fast facts, management level positions for a state agency. You're talking 45 to $55,000 a year potentially. And this is an individual that had to obtain a graduate level degree Super to get expensive. that position. <laughs> These people are not driving brand new cars and trucks. The division definitely has vehicles that they use day to day. You kind of have to. You kind of have to have a vehicle. I'm not sold. This is, again, this is a soapbox for me. I'm not sold on the division trying to make money off of the resources of Utah. I genuinely think they're trying to do the best job that they can to manage wildlife for the citizens of of Utah. Um, Yeah, and that's, that's my point of like, I get really sick of that one. That one drives me nuts. I'm like, my hell. As soon as somebody says that to me, division's all about the money. I'm just like, I shut off. I'm done. Yeah. And that's that's my point. Everybody wants everything to be cheaper, mm-hmm. but they want everything to be better at the same time. Sure. They want it cheaper, but they want it better. Mm-hmm. It, doesn't, it doesn't work like that. Yep. It, just, it can't work like that. It can't. Mm-hmm. Like they, they can 10X the permit prices and have a lot more money. That potentially may be one way to go. Sure. Or they can keep the tag prices the same and or up them a little bit and cut permits and that's one way to go i mean is but it, you can't have the same opportunity and better quality as a resident of utah if they have to increase my buck permit to you know from 55 or whatever it is to 105 so that some division employee can maintain his forty five thousand yeah. dollar a year salary i'm all for it i i, I literally am for i'm all for it um I, I that one drives me bonkers but 
I guess take home for me all these proposals. I can, I can support shortened seasons. Uh, I cannot support uh, antler restrictions. I don't like the idea mm-hmm. at all. I think it's ineffective. I think the science would show as much. Uh, I don't like weapon restrictions specifically for compound bows. Again, that one's a little bit personal. Um, you know, hopefully as this goes through the rack process, they're a little bit malleable. Hopefully there can be some adjustment and change. I do hope, um, if Utah does this, uh, if they do it, I hope it's short term. I hope we legitimately are talking four years. I hope we are talking learned lessons. What data, what can we take from this to then turn into better management? They should have a playbook going into it. This is specifically what we are looking for. And we are going to track these specific Mm. things from year to year, not just going to a blind and be like, oh, see what happens. And and I think they do. I think they've got a pretty good idea on what they're looking for. Mm. I just hope that when those are met, you know, I hope they learn something from it if they do go forward with it. And I hope on the backside of it, it means good things for wildlife and, and for general season deer hunting. This is like probably the last thing I'm going to say and I'll shut up. But I really hope that we maintain general season. And I say general season. These are draw permits and I get it. It might take three to five points or so for a resident to draw some of these permits. But these are opportunity type hunts. These are hunts that you can draw every three to five years. Some of them may be quicker if you're willing to hunt a lesser unit with a tougher weapon. But I hope we maintain that for the, you know, the people. I hope, I, I don't want to see these converted to limited entry units. I don't want to see them converted to like big buck only, you know, and they're extremely hard to draw and you got to wait years. Or, you know, if you draw a Pine Valley tag, you can only shoot a four point plus buck. I just want to see opportunity to the very best ability maintained for residents and non-residents. Yep. That's my take home. Uh, and I would agree. I completely support that. Anyway. Did, did you, uh, maybe one more thing. Do you see some of the comments where people were like, we should just close down units? Yeah. I hear that one weeks, a lot. Several years. Hey, what, what do you think one would year, happen if years. we just closed these units down for two years? Yeah. What would happen? I mean, that's the same as cutting permits. It is. It's the same thing. Sure. It's and I'd be in favor entire, of that. I, it's I just would an actually, entire cut of permits uh, yeah, instead I, of a I, cut. I would actually be yeah. like that one I could I could understand. You know what I mean? Some of the other ones I can't necessarily. I just I don't like I don't like antler restrictions. Just I don't, I, I don't I, think it's gonna work. That one is complete it's funny, opposite of what you're trying to do. It's really interesting is like the number of people I've talked to and the comments that I've read that people are just like, Hell yes, this is we are, we are moving in the right direction. I'm just yeah. like, I don't get it. I don't get it. It's, in, it's an easy, it, it, honestly, it is easy to like understand where they're coming from because in theory, it's so simple, sure. right? It's like, Oh, yep. Mm-hmm. That means every buck that's getting killed is a four year old. And then it'll give every buck a chance to get to four point. Yeah. Well, a yeah. lot of two year olds are four points and not every buck ever will be a four point. So you're just, I, you're doing the exact opposite yeah. of what you're wanting. I just like to keep it simple. Let's have an archery hunt. Let's have a muzzleloader hunt. Let's have a rifle hunt. Let's manage for general season deer buck to doe ratios anywhere from 15 to 21. I'm totally okay with a permit that I can draw every few years. I have a realistic chance to draw it. And when I get out there, I don't feel like the pressure's unbelievable, mm-hmm. but I still have the opportunity if I hunt hard to kill a mature buck. And mm-hmm. I feel like this is, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of frustrated to be honest, because I feel like I have that right now. I yeah. feel like they've done a pretty good job to be honest. I feel like they've done a great job and you know, I'm, I'm the anomaly because it feels like everybody else says they, they suck. And I'm like, I feel like I'm having pretty good hunts. So I don't know what I'm seeing that you guys aren't. Um, so for me personally, I'm frustrated with, with the change, but, um, I guess take home, attend rack meetings, get involved, send your comments to your local, you know, boards, your rack boards, your wildlife boards, and, you know, get involved and express your opinion. Cause if you don't, you know, who knows with Man. that, anything else? That well, was a hot one. We were talking. Well, consider I'm, I'm still like working through it in real time. Cause it's the first I've yeah. heard of it. Yeah. Man, that's, uh, yeah, definitely not population is what I'm getting from that. Definitely not. Yeah. Man, you know, another worry I have, and this will really be it. Like, let's say that we have, which we're predicting, and if we have, let's say we have 100% annual precip, and we have real good years the next three years, and those that also mm-hmm. happens in conjunction with, with these management the strategies. Oh, I know where you're going here. Which one is it? Yeah, yeah which, one, which one is actually beneficial? Well, I guarantee you at the end of that, 
most people are not going to say it was mother nature. They're going to say, man, Oh, this management, this is perfect. We nailed yeah, it. Yeah. Oh, so anyway, uh, I guess we got to wrap it up. Cody says our camera's overheating. So attend rack meetings, shoot us a comment. I'd love to hear you guys feedback. Yeah, drop your comments on YouTube. Send them in, even if you're non-resident. If you're resident, yep. definitely send them in. But let your voice be heard. Cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks.